Good morning. I will now call the December 13th San Diego County Board of Supervisors regular meeting and fire protection meeting to order. I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. I'll note that Supervisor Desmond is absent. With that, Supervisor Anderson. Supervisor Lawson Reamer? Here. Vice Chair Vargas? Here. Chair Fletcher? Fletcher here. We will begin this morning with the invocation. The invocation will be delivered by my dear friend, Rabbi Lori Cosby, CEO of San Diego Continuing Education Foundation. We welcome you back to join us again and ask everyone to please rise. Good morning, supervisors, Chair Fletcher, and friends. I was honored to offer the invocation at Supervisor Fletcher's first meeting as the chair of the Board of Supervisors and today I'm so incredibly gratified to be here with you to add my voice of thanks, of deep gratitude to yours, to our leaders, to our constituents, to those who are here with us and particularly to the many who are not here today. For surely under the tenure of Supervisor Fletcher, it is the many who have been seen, whose lives who have been made better. We come to this moment as you step down from the chair in gratitude and recognition of your efforts. Many of our religious traditions, especially at this season, remind us that it is up to us to light a candle to help us see through the darkness. Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, Diwali, Solstice, other holy seasons, including Ramadan, all teach us to be the ones who bring the light. You supervisors, your talented staffs. The outward and inward facing departments at our county have had the opportunity to light the candles of justice and service to those of us who trust you with our well being. There is new light in this county because you have lit the candles of equity, inclusion, diversity, fairness, compassion more brightly than ever before. As Amanda Gorman said so powerfully, there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. You supervisors have become visionary and brave. Chair Flesher, as you pass the candle to Chair-elect Vargas, we know that you have been our light. May we be blessed in this season of light, and may our light increase during these holy days to illuminate the pathways to justice and peace. Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi Lori. The invocation uh, having been delivered, we will now go to the Pledge of Allegiance, will be delivered by Jessica Valentin's class from Vista Unified School District. And we welcome them, I believe, virtually. There they are. Thank you all so much for joining us. Please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Please place your right hand over your heart. Con tu mano derecha tu corazón. Thank you so much for joining our board meeting today. Oh, I think they're still going. Are they singing? Is there sound? Oh. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day at school. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, everyone uh, for, uh, for, for being here today. Uh, it was a great honor uh, in November to be reelected to a second term of the Board of Supervisors, uh, more than 30 point victory. And I look forward to the work ahead of us uh, on the Board of Supervisors. And I look forward to continuing uh, all of the efforts that we've undertaken uh, in the last four years and in particular under the last two years. Uh, and also would like to know, it's been a tremendous honor to serve as chair of the Board of Supervisors uh, for two consecutive years. When someone 
said it had been almost 100 years since someone had done consecutive years. Uh, I was surprised, but also understand that the, the role, all of the roles we hold here, uh, come with a, a great honor, but also with a great responsibility. And so I'm very proud of what we've done as a county, and I'm very proud to have led our county the last two years um, as chair, as we seek to tackle issues of behavioral health, uh, protecting our workers, providing fair and equitable pay and treatment, helping to rebuild the middle class, uh, climate action plan, tackling the opioid epidemic, uh, the fentanyl crisis, uh, working to really put forward a county that invests in the lives of San Diegans, recognizing the inherent dignity and value uh, of every single member of our community. Uh, of course, the actions through the pandemic were incredibly difficult and incredibly hard, but as a county, we came together through it all. Uh, and we never lost sight of, uh, of our primary mission uh, of taking care of one another and looking out for one another. And I'm incredibly proud of all the work that we've done. I uh, look forward to continuing to serve on the Board of Supervisors, uh, but we'll note this will be my last meeting as chair. It's my intention in January when we reconvene to uh, nominate Vice Chair Nora Vargas, who's been an incredible leader, an incredible vice chair, uh, and I know, uh, I believe, will make a fabulous chair of the Board of Supervisors. Uh, but remain fully engaged in the county uh, and look forward to continuing all of our work. With that, let's move on to our uh, regular items and agenda. We have proclamations. The first proclamation will be from Supervisor Joel Anderson and myself honoring Sheriff Tony Ray and accepting this proclamation will be our sheriff. I think there's something uh, very noble uh, about service and the notion that you get up every single day and you get everyone up. Who else you got coming? My wife and I today. Just your wife and you. Okay. Welcome. Uh, you know, I, I think there's something incredibly noble about service. Um, the notion you get up every single day and you dedicate your life to helping others. Um, and so many of our county employees and county workers do that. Uh, that is what they do. They get up every day and they serve. Uh, but in particular, the members of our sheriff's department who get up and are willing to put their own life on the line and put their own uh, safety uh, in jeopardy in order to ensure a safe community. Uh, it takes a tremendous strain and toll, not just on them, but on their family members. Uh, and as a county, we're incredibly grateful uh, for that service and those who dedicate their life. And we really appreciate and today and want to say a special thank you uh, to Tony Ray. Uh, at a period of potential instability and, and challenges in our department, when the previous sheriff stepped down, uh, Tony Ray didn't flinch. He was willing to step up into a difficult job at a difficult time, uh, providing steady hand and leadership, which is what he has done throughout his life, uh, throughout his decades of service. And so, Sheriff, I want you to know that we appreciate you tremendously. Uh, we appreciate uh, what you have done throughout your entire life, including the culmination of your career here serving as our sheriff. Uh, appreciate your focus on engaging with members of the community, helping us navigate through the challenges that we face uh, in our jails, always being accessible uh, and never losing sight of why you're there to protect our community. And so Supervisor Anderson and myself wanted to come together today uh, to honor and recognize uh, in January we will be swearing in a new sheriff. Uh, but we appreciate tremendously your entire life, uh, your service to our community, uh, and everything that it means. And we look forward to always staying in touch and, and, and having you around as a part of San Diego. So thank you very much, Sheriff Ray, for all your work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, Chair Fletcher. I uh, am very honored today to recognize the dedicated service of Sheriff Anthony Ray. Uh, you know, Living in the unincorporated area, we count on you more than anyone else. Uh, you and the fire department are so important to our lives. And I just want to thank you for the safety, the, the, the stability, and the protection of the unincorporated communities. Uh, you've you've uh, been there for us. Uh, I know that when you're the interim sheriff, it's, it's hard because people are waiting for the permanent sheriff. But you took on the job as if uh, you're going to be there for a decade. And you really started to change the culture in a positive way that makes it better for all San Diegans. So I really appreciate it. And uh, the other part I wanted to thank you is 
You had three decades. You could have sat back and not stepped up. This was, the, being an interim sheriff is a lot of hard work, a lot of learning curve, and yet you stood up and put yourself through that gauntlet of the, of the process of being chosen. And I just want to thank you for that devotion to our community. The community partnerships and public safety distinguishes you as a true and selfless leader. And with that, I'd like to read the last paragraph of the uh, proclamation. Whereas the County of San Diego is committed to recognizing and honoring those individuals that are dedicated to the best ideals of public service, and Sheriff Anthony Ray is one such worthy individual. Now therefore be it proclaimed by Chair Fletcher and all the members of the Board of Supervisors on this 13th day of December, 2022, that they commend Sheriff Anthony Ray for his outstanding service, leadership, and commitment to the citizens of San Diego County. And we do hereby declare today to be Sheriff Anthony Ray Day throughout San Diego County. Congratulations, Sheriff. Thank you very much. Uh, being, being the Sheriff of San Diego County, has been the highest privilege and honor of my professional career. And uh, I would like to publicly state that although I've only been the sheriff for about eight and a half months, um, the Board of Supervisors has given me every single thing I've asked for to help support the security and the safety for the people of San Diego County, and I greatly appreciate that. I would also like to say that uh, I, I am honored, I, I'm humbled uh, to, to receive this award. Thank you all very much. Uh, but but the, true, the true heroes uh, in the Sheriff's Department are the people that show up every day, day and night, day and night. We have thousands over 4,000 deputies and professional staff, and they show up every day working in the jails and the courts and patrol. These are the people that, uh, I mean, in, in these meetings, you sometimes hear people that are not happy. Certainly in the press, you hear the negative things that happen, and we can always do better. We can always do better as a public safety agency. But you rarely hear about, about efforts like the RESPECT program, where people in San Marcos deal with at-risk teenagers, kids in junior high school and their families, or the Spanish Academy, where we work with migrants and we speak only in their language, or Camp Lead, which deals with a diverse group of children and lets them know that we're actually all part of the same human race and we can work together to do better. We have phenomenal partnerships with, with county agencies like Health and Human Services to work on mental health care, homelessness, and other issues. And then we have phenomenal partnerships with non-government agencies like San Diego Youth Services that helps us take kids and not put them into the criminal justice system, but give them an alternative and helps them provide for their lives and go forward. So I am so honored and, uh, and emotional. And I'm very happy to have had the chance to lead this organization. And I want you to know that you are in great hands. There are thousands of strong men and women at all ranks in the Sheriff's Department. They're working right now, and they're going to be working in the future. And I step off knowing that we're going to be OK. And I thank you very much for this honor. Our next proclamation will be from uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer and myself honoring UCSD Mother Child Adolescent Program. And accepting this proclamation will be Dr. Stephen Spector and anyone else that you would like to bring up. Last uh, December 1st was World AIDS Day. The uh, international theme was putting ourselves to the test, achieving equity to end HIV. This theme urges us to end inequities that exacerbate the HIV AIDS epidemic uh, and to be bold in everything that we do. Here at the county, we are proud to work closely with many different organizations throughout San Diego County 
that are focused on the simple goal of getting to zero new cases of HIV. This morning, Supervisor Lawson Reamer and I are honored to highlight the work of UCSD Mother Child Adolescent HIV Program, MCAP, which offers excellent care to women, children, young adults living with HIV throughout San Diego County. MCAP is the only program within San Diego County with a sole focus of providing HIV AIDS prevention, medical care and services to women, youth and pregnant people and their newborns. The services MCAP offered are life affirming. A few of the invaluable services they can provide are complete and confidential HIV care, support groups for women, children and youth with HIV, mental health services and substance use counseling, bilingual case management support with care plans, the work MCAP and their team do on a daily basis has a direct impact in our region. They support some of our neighbors with an estimated 13,000 people in the county living with HIV AIDS. We want to thank you for all that you do. We are incredibly grateful for the work and we are incredibly pleased to stand with you all today and look forward to continuing to partner with you in the future. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Uh, thank you, Chair Fletcher. It's my honor to present this proclamation, and thank you to our guests for joining us today. As a mother, I know how important it is to have access to health resources and ensure our youngest minds have the safety net they need to reach their potential. The UCSD Mother Child Adolescent Program has successfully prevented the transmission of HIV AIDS for hundreds of infants born to people living with HIV in San Diego County. This program saves lives, and I am confident that through programs like MCAP, we will continue to be a beacon of hope for some of the most vulnerable members of our community. The County of San Diego, alongside our community partners, plays a critical role. And with the UCSD MCAP program, we can amplify our work to reach the zero HIV goals. We know this work is not easy, but from the bottom of my heart, thank you for all that you do. It does not go unnoticed. And with that said, it is my honor to present this proclamation. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by Chairman Nathan Fletcher, my office, and all members of the San Diego County Board of Supervisors that we commend the UCSD Mother Child Adolescent Program for their outstanding service, leadership, and commitment to county residents, and do hereby declare the 13th day of December to be UCSD Mother Child Adolescent Program Day throughout San Diego County. We are joined by Dr. Steven Spector, who will be accepting the proclamation on behalf of MCAP. Please join us for this recognition. Chair Fletcher, supervisors, I have to say that I'm particularly honored to accept this proclamation from Chair Fletcher, who not only has been a great supporter of the HIV AIDS community, but also was a great advocate uh, during and still the COVID epidemic. So it's an honor at your last meeting to accept this. I am honored to accept the proclamation on behalf of the UCSD Mother Child Adolescent HIV Program. This is a wonderful recognition of our team who have been dedicated to improving the lives of those HIV infected pregnant persons, women, children and youth who are infected and affected by HIV. When we began the UCSD Mother Child Adolescent Program more than 30 years ago, mothers were frequently transmitting the virus to their newborns and HIV AIDS was invariably a fatal illness. The UCSD Mother Child Adolescent Program has led the way in developing strategies to prevent the transmission of HIV from an infected mother to her infant and improve treatments for those infected. Today, I am pleased to say that we can prevent the transmission of HIV from an infected pregnant mother to her infant, and HIV infection has been changed from an invariably fatal disease to a chronic illness. 
These advances have changed the lives of many persons within San Diego. I remember early in the epidemic when a grandmother whose daughter was dying of AIDS came to me and asked, should I bond with my grandchild? Because she felt that he was going to die. Well, I would like to say that this infant is now married with a family of four healthy children. We have many stories like this today, and we have many girls who have become young women who have given birth to healthy children as well. However, despite these tremendous advances, HIV remains an important challenge and over 13,000 people in San Diego are still living with HIV. Over 1,700 are females with new infections continuing to occur. A disproportionate number of those infected are for minorities, communities of color, and those economically disadvantaged. Despite not having a vaccine or a cure, we know how to prevent HIV transmission because one pill once a day or an injection every two months can suppress the virus fully. However, to enable these treatments to be the greatest benefit requires the provision of the kind of social services, case management, psychiatric services, nutrition support, substance use counseling, and other services that are provided by the Mother-Child Adolescent Program. Our team of doctors, nurses, social workers, case managers, psychologists, outreach workers, and others provide these services to the most needy in our com community. These trauma-informed services are provided in a culturally sensitive manner to persons of diverse backgrounds without regard to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, or social circumstances. And they are provided with respect and dignity. Behind me are the true heroes of our program. They deserve your credentials. Again, thank you for this honor. It is our privilege to have an opportunity to have served San Diego. Thank you again. Take a photo. Our third proclamation will be from Vice Chair Nora Vargas, honoring San Ysidro Health Casa. Accepting the proclamation will be Anna Malgoza. Hello, good morning. Good morning, good morning. As everybody's making their way up here, I just want to say that today it is absolutely my honor to recognize the innovative work of San Isidro Health and their commitment to providing compassionate healthcare and services for all. 
Specifically today, I want to uplift their work in providing quality HIV services to people in a caring and supportive environment where guests can feel at home and are treated like family and friends. Their HIV services mission is to provide a continuity of medical, social, and supportive services that identify with our culture and better enrich the quality of life and health for people living with HIV and AIDS, as well as their families. They are a one-stop shop for HIV services where information and resources are offered in a welcoming, home-like setting, which promotes social interaction and encourage re recreational activities. San Isidro Health actually has two HIV-coordinated services centers, Casa in South Bay, and our place in Southeast San Diego. Both centers provide case management and assistance in navigating the HIV care system, including resources to medic medical care, medications, housing, food, transportation, and other social services. Earlier this month, on December 1st, people around the world recognized World AIDS Day. The first ever Global Health Day was established back in 1988. This is an opportunity for the global community to come together to unite and among other things, they really think about how we fight against HIV, to short support for people living with HIV, and to commemorate those who have died from AIDS-related illnesses. And I think one of the most important things that uh, this does is really bring to light the importance of demystifying what it means to be living with HIV and AIDS. The dark and unfortunate stigma that exists historically in our world and, and what our world experienced during the AIDS crisis claimed more than 40 million people. It was a disease that no one wanted to talk about, discuss, or deal with not that long ago. And so I want to say thank you. We are grateful for all of the scientific and medical advancements in the HIV treatment since the 1980s, and we know now that it's no longer a death sentence. Although millions still live with HIV and AIDS today, antiretroviral treatments can slow the course of the disease and lead to a near normal life expectancy. Today, there is still a vital need in our world to continue to increase awareness. We need to continue to treat those who are diagnosed, improve the education around HIV and AIDS, preventing the spread, fight prejudice and discrimination, and stigmatize unfounded fear from this epidemic that we have so much more knowledge about now than we did before. I want to just say thank you to the amazing staff at San Isidro Health who work tirelessly to make this possible. The County of San Diego appreciates the culturally relevant work San, Diego Health, uh, San Isidro Health has engaged with for many years. And therefore today, I'm going to ask um, Kevin. Kevin and Brenda. Brenda. <laughs> Therefore, today, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, we are honored to recognize San Isidro Health for the tremendous life-saving and quality of care work that they've done through the HIV services and are proud to proclaim San Isidro Health Casa Day throughout the County of San Diego. So congratulations. Now I'll turn it over to you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Like we accept this proclamation on behalf of our, our uh, HIV services and support team, the 2,500 employees of San Ysidro Health, our board of directors, and the 125,000 patients in our care every, uh, annually. Um, we've been blessed um, to see a program grow from when I started 22 years ago to in a modular trailer next to the San Ysidro, the main San Ysidro Health Center site, to multiple services service sites and programs throughout San Diego County. Um, we've been blessed with a tremendous transition in leadership from my, in my time from Rosanna Sc Scolari to Carla Torres and now Brenda Huerta. So I'm going to turn it over to Brenda. For all, thank you for all you do and thank you to the county supervisors for recognizing us for our efforts. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you to the board. Thank you, Nora, for being our supporter. And thank you, uh, Mikey Lochner, for initiating this and recognizing the work that we do. Um, yeah, and over the 20 years, we've been able you know, to serve individuals, families, um, and we continue to provide um, information and support, building trusting relationships with our communities or, and with our individuals that really generate an impact in our community. Um, I was thinking this morning about one of our participants who comes to one of our sites, who is um, transgender, Latina, and is unhoused and comes in and just sits for a while. Sometimes they, you know, she doesn't really need any services, but she comes and sits there. She feels safe in that space. And I always think about how that one person who we serve and who we make an impact on 
just you know goes on to the community. She has brought partners, she has brought friends to get tested, to get services, and so it never you know, goes away in my mind how important it is to make that in individual connection with each one of our patients to be able to make an impact in our community. So thank you. It's an honor to provide this, to have this job and provide this service. And thank you for recognizing it. So, thanks. Thank you all. Congratulations. Uh, our fourth and final proclamation will be from Supervisor Joel Anderson for Ernie Dronenberg. Accepting this proclamation will be Mr. Dronenberg. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it's an honor to be here today to recognize our Ernest J. Dronenberg, Jr., or as we fondly know him as Ernie, upon his retirement. Uh, Ernie's given us over 50 years or five decades of public service, but today we're only recognizing the last 12 uh, working for the county as the San Diego County Assessor and Recorder and County Clerk. Ernie honorably utilized his expertise and his experience as a nationally recognized tax expert to provide transparent and consideration to public tax services to the communities of San Diego County. Now, I, I will tell you that uh, there are three things that come to mind when I think about Ernie Dronenberg. Uh, one is uh, when other assessors uh, were for, were, had to be sued in order for them to look at uh, the downturn market and adjust people's taxes, Ernie proactively did it. When it came to uh, reaching out to the military, because we had so many uh, people in the military here retired in San Diego County, and they didn't know the tax benefits they had coming to them, Ernie proactively had a team go out and let them know about the tax benefits that they earned by serving our country. But not only that, he had an innovative approach, not just cons consumer uh, service oriented, but during COVID, he, he made sure that people in San Diego County, uh, as county clerk, were able to get married. Uh, he figured out a plan that was COVID approved, that no other county was doing at the time, and you opened the doors uh, so that people could get married. So uh, Ernie, I, I truly appreciate your innovative approach, uh, your commitment to our community. And uh, I, the third thing I think of is uh, Ernie is one of those folks that uh, public service is true to his heart, and he has spent a lot of time uh, befriending young people, helping them in their careers, and mentoring all of us. Uh, Ernie, you've, you've gone above and beyond the job. I appreciate it so much. You can see it in your staff and how they approach their job and what a great job they do. So I just want to say thank you uh, to you and to the staff, your staff for your devotion to the people of San Diego County. And with that, I'd like to read uh, uh, the last paragraph of the proclamation. Whereas the County of San Diego is committed to recognizing and honoring those individuals that are dedicated to the best ideals of public service, in San Diego County Assessor, Ernest J. Dronenberg, Jr. is one such worthy individual. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by Chair Fletcher and all the members of the County Board of Supervisors on this 13th day of December 2022 that they commend, er, uh, commend Assessor Ernie J. Dronenberg, Jr. for his unyielding service to San Diego County Assessor, Recorder, 
in county clerk's office in its nearly half century of public service and do hereby declare today to be Ernest J. Dronenberg Jr. Day throughout San Diego County. Ernie, thank you so much for all your service. Thank you for putting in a team together that, that puts taxpayers first and all San Diegans. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Anderson and all the supervisors. Thank you very much. It's, I've enjoyed working with you and you're a great bunch. And uh, uh, Chairman Fletcher, we'll miss you, but uh, welcome. Supervisor Nora Vargas. Um, I came this morning with my people that made that resolution possible. These are my chief executives, and they're the ones that this, these words that were read, these are the ones, I'm just the pretty face in front of everybody. <laughs> they're the ones that know how to get things done and did get things done to accomplish everything that I've done for the last 12 years. And uh, we've had a lot of fun, but we've got a lot of work done, and I, I'm so glad that they were able to be with me this morning. If they hadn't have shown up, there would have been a pink slip in their box. But <laughs> other than that, uh, they're wonderful people, and um, I thank them all for being here this morning. Um, I want to thank you, the uh, people of San Diego County, for giving me the opportunity to be your elected representative to do tax administration. Um, and we're talking about 12 years here. But I also want to mention that I'm very, very fortunate to have been the president of the County Board of Education and um, a member of that board for five years. And we've got great education support in this county. It's very important. And that's another office that I think is, does a great job. So in addition to being the assessor, I collect the money, they, they spend the money, but uh, Dan actually collects the money. I assess the money. Dan is the mean guy that collects the money. <laughs> but thank you all for being here, and thank you, Board of Supervisors, and once again for the resolution. Thank you, Ernie. Congratulations. <clears throat> Next on the agenda is non-agendized public communication. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board on matters that are within our jurisdiction but are not on today's agenda. The only action the board may take is a referral to the chief administrative officer. Reminder, according to Rule 4A, members of the public who are non-English speaking and need interpretation assistance will be allotted additional time to facilitate translation. According to the rules of procedure, we will hear from up to five in-person speakers and five virtual speakers. Any remaining requests for non-agendized public communication will be resumed at the conclusion of our agendized business. At this point, I'll ask the clerk to call forward up to five in-person and five virtual speakers. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 33 requests to speak on matters not listed on the agenda, 13 in person, and 20 requesting to speak by phone. For those that requested to speak by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers, and as the chair indicated, we'll be calling the first five speakers. As your name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. You'll have two minutes to address the board. I'd like to invite forward the following individuals. Mark, Jeff Noway, Bryant Rumbaugh, Crystal Irving, and Oliver Twist. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. You may come forward in any order. Good 
Mark, the invocation is total bullshit. 250 million gallons of water was just intentionally released from Lake Hodges Reservoir as rates increase. LA starts drinking polluted water now, and you are poisoning our third largest aquifer from El Monte Sand Mine now. The City Council removed the only sentence requiring sdg and &E rates to be low for consumers from the franchise agreement last year, and you criminals have done nothing to fix it. Clinical Research in Cardiology, official journal of German Cardiac Society. Patients were found dead at home after post-mortem photos proving epimyocarditis. Their direct quote from their peer-reviewed and published autopsy is, myocarditis can be a potentially lethal complication following mRNA-based anti-SARS-CoV-2 vaccination, end quote. So anyone forced to be vaccinated for employment by Nathan Fletcher and other board members and got myocarditis can sue the supervisors responsible personally, as this coercion is also a crime against humanity, according to the United Nations. Thousands of convicted pedophiles in California are being released from prison in less than a year, and Nathan Fletcher made it so they can go in the women's restrooms. Despicable. Vaccinated people now make up a majority of COVID deaths, 58% according to the Washington Post. A quote from Kevin Baker, Director of Governmental Relations for ACLU. The problem of homelessness is caused by the cost of housing, and we won't solve homelessness, mental health, or substance abuse problems in our communities by locking people up and drugging them against their will. New funding for housing and services would be good if we also keep in mind that people don't lose their civil liberties just because the, because the government wants to help them, no matter how sincerely, end quote. We need better pay from corporations to afford housing. <clears throat> what happened to Audrey when you guys had her removed is absolutely uncalled for and, and undue force. Uh, once she was in the hall, the, you already had her fingerprints. You could, could have just let her go, locked the door, given her a ticket. She always comes back. She's here for every agenda item for the people. It was absurd. Thank you. Next speaker, please. All right, Brian Rumbaugh. So I'm going to go ahead and say I did uh, like your little pooch that you walked through this morning, and congratulations on uh, you know becoming the next chair. Let's really hope that maybe things kind of take a turn for the better next year. It was actually uh, the uh, August 30th meeting, the first meeting that I showed up, and I actually witnessed that man flip off my friend. And it was really, yeah, you did, bro, just, just like that, okay? It, it happened. I witnessed it with my eyes. I live my life in truth, okay? I understand, I understand the positions that everybody's been in, okay? Um, I got a lot to talk about here, but uh, as far as this... Uh, incident that occurred last meeting, I got to tell you, uh, you know, the people in San Diego County, they had, they had an opportunity, and I know uh, pretty much to get themselves a constitutional sheriff. That's actually what led me to be uh, showing up at your, uh, you know, dog and pony shows here. And that, you guys, during that primary election, you had really poor voter turnout. I know in this previous election that just happened a couple weeks ago, apparently it was relatively decent. You know, uh, underneath that carpet right there, this is actually uh, pretty much a lightweight concrete. If, if you were to run on it, it's gonna be harder on your knees than blacktop. So to, to see a full felony takedown, the way that that, the, way, the video is very graphic. I, I'm gonna go ahead and leave a couple cards here. I already gave one to, to Sheriff Ray. You know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell him right now, uh, Deputy Gonzalez, uh, you know, needs to kind of do a little bit of self-introspection because that this is not acceptable in this country. And if you think people are going to stand back and just allow it to happen, you're sadly mistaken. Thanks. Next speaker, please. My name is Jeff. The excessive force used on Audra Morgan last meeting while seven other deputies stood around watching was absolutely horrendous. It was inexcusable. It was an embarrassment to the law enforcement profession, to the county, and to all of humanity. If the deputy had been in a fight for his life, then yeah, sure, by all means, go ahead and drop your weight on the back of the neck of your suspect. I mean, it's essentially the same thing as pulling the trigger on your sidearm. You might think it's a stretch, but it can certainly be considered deadly force. The deputy's a big guy. Dropping all that weight as he did with the point of his elbow on the cervical spine of a tiny woman, that made me sick to watch. Here's the catch. The deputy was not 
in a fight for his life. He wasn't in a fight at all. And what was Audra's crime? Speaking out of turn? God forbid the citizens express their emotions while you guys run a deceptive genocide of vaccines and remdesivir. Yeah, look up. Listen, two deputies could have very easily and smoothly escorted Audra out of here and professionally placed her in handcuffs if they thought they really needed to go that far, right? But no, the deputy had to drag her out of the room by one arm on the ground like she's some kind of animal. Nathan, you are the ringleader of this corrupt circus. You sick the deputies on Audra. You're responsible for her black eye, her dislocated rib, and whatever other trauma she sustained. Deputies, please remember your oath. Remember how much it meant the day you were sworn in. Do not let these tyrants up here ruin your name or our profession. Because that's exactly what they want. They want the blind, order-following, boot-licking, brown shirt commie types. I, for one, know damn well that's not what any of you signed up for. The only people you should be putting in handcuffs are sitting up here beyond Thank the you. marble. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, good morning. Oliver Twist here. First, I just want to address, I heard some mocking laughter when they talked about the flip-off incident, whether it happened or not. And, and aside from that, the, my concern is there should be an archival way to discern. And the fact that there's no archival security footage available, that is concerning. And I think we should all be able to agree with that, especially in the arson at your house and the, the threats and that you have security. So please have archival security footage available. Um, a heartfelt uh, thank you to Helen Robbins Myers, uh, not sure when your official last day is, but I do want to thank you for your steadfast, prudent, and sound leadership over the years. I'm asking you now to incorporate, a, again, a split screen display in the video recording for the meetings. So there's an archival record of whether supervisors and staff are engaged and paying attention when we the people speak. As things stand now, you get a historical pass on whether you're engaged in active listening or instead spending the public comments staring down at your phone. In the name of transparency, I'd like your degree of engagement as well as your reactions to be archivally recorded for all to see. Lastly, as this year winds down, thank you, Andrew, I appreciate that. Lastly, as this year winds down, we look forward to new. I'm asking you to please plan to light up the county building with white lights sometime during the week of January 15th to 22nd to honor the sanctity of human life. The county has long a tradition of lighting this beautiful building up in various colors to celebrate assorted causes and people. In that vein, I'm asking you to please light the building up on behalf of human life. I'm also asking you to fly this flag to commemorate the sanctity of human life. It seems a natural segue coming just a month after the Human Rights Day, which you celebrated three days ago on December 10th. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights tells us, quote, we need to stand up for, the rights, for our rights and those of others. So now I ask you to continue to demonstrate that commitment to human rights and Thank sanctity you. of all life. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning, my name is Crystal Irving and I'm proud to serve as president of SEIU Local 221, representing more than 10,000 county workers and other members in our region. I wanna take a moment to thank Chair Fletcher for his leadership on this board. Prior to becoming president, I remember the days at Marina Village, working alongside Chair Fletcher with Invest in San Diego families, while advocating to a board that did not care to invest in its workforce or the communities that we get to serve. I remember the hope we felt when we got one ally in you on this board and the pain we felt when we couldn't even get a another supervisor to second a discussion on hazard pay for working frontline employees that we represented during some of the darkest days of COVID. This board has definitely changed since those days, particularly with the addition of Vice Chair Vargas and Supervisor Lawson Reamer. And in addition to steering this ship during the worst of the COVID crisis, Chair Fletcher and the new board led on investments in behavioral health, veterans and immigrant families, to name a few, and led the charge to stop the attempted outsourcing on jail uh, employees. 
The best leaders know how to listen, and Chair Fletcher has taken the time to meet with our members, listen to our members, and take action for our members. And as chair, he has been a champion for our employees' needs for more staffing and competitive pay, and was at the helm during the historic SEIU contract victory this year. And another hallmark of great leadership is being able to celebrate the victories while acknowledging that we still have a ways to go. And this is a tension that Chair Fletcher remembers and one that we certainly won't let him forget. Chair Fletcher, thank you for partnering with us in the work to make San Diego County better for everyone. We appreciate the highs and the lows that we've experienced while working together because we have made strides for working people and working families in this region. We look forward to continuing to work with you and your successor leading this board in a new era of supervisor representation as we continue winning for our members and the communities that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. Now we will hear from those. Now we'll hear from those that requested to speak by phone. Again, we'll be hearing from the first five callers. The remaining callers will be heard at the conclusion of today's session. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll start with our first caller. My name is Therese Heimer, and I give comments today on behalf of San Diegans for Gun Violence Prevention. We want to thank Nathan Fletcher for his leadership these past two years as chair of the board. He has been a steady leader on the issue that is our group's focus and passion. Together with Supervisor Lawson Reamer, Chair Fletcher introduced both ghost gun and safe firearm storage ordinances in 2021. This marked an important shift of focus by the county to laws that could protect against harm from firearms. The county's broader and continuing work on gun violence reduction shows Chair Fletcher's understanding that the scope of actions that need to be taken will never be encompassed in any single subject ordinance. The inclusive approach being taken by the county to obtain input from all of those impacted by gun violence reflects a core strength exhibited under Chair Fletcher's leadership listening to the broader community. We know your commitment by the fact that you show up. You show up to events. You stop at protests on a corner. You show up simply to talk to county residents and understand what is important to them. So thank you, Chair Fletcher, for your attention and your leadership in addressing not only gun violence, but also the many other issues critically important to the health and safety of the county. Your calm resolve at county supervisors' meetings was key to getting through the crucible of the past few years. And what a crucible it has been, from the novel dangers that COVID presented to all of our lives, to difficult situations in supervisors' meetings, to a fire being set at the front of your house. Our county is better for your combination of determination and a compassionate approach to government. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. I am Roseanne Sharp, founder of Never Again CA. In two years, Nathan Fletcher has transformed the Board of Supervisors into an energetic, let's get it right and let's get it done now convening body. Maybe it's Nathan's training as a Marine that made us always feel that when working with him, we could count on the best outcome. When we have asked for help, he has not hesitated to respond. San Diego County had not kept up with the new threats in gun violence epidemic, such as ghost guns. When brought to his attention, he responded quickly and decisively with critical legislation. In working with his staff, you can see they have one mission, achieve the goal. There is no messing around and no fluff. It is simply let's get it done in a way that will improve lives, fulfilling Nathan's commitment. Getting it done right means calling on experts and getting data to make smart, collaborative decisions. Issues do not drag on. Discussions and study groups do not spew out useless reports. Problems get solved, and then the solutions are reviewed for improvement and better practices. Getting it done right, whether it is about ghost guns or mental health, move to resolution in months, not years. Nathan's command of his job responsibilities and mission are critical to us because our mission at Never Again CA is saving lives. It has been an incredibly rewarding experience to work with Nathan and his team. We thank you for your leadership, Nathan. 
We know we can count on you to do even more to save lives, and that is what working with you as a top makes a top-rated experience in the legions of government. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Yeah, it's Jim Ellis. You know, I saw what took place at the last Board of Supervisors meeting where Nathan Fletcher erratically called out his warnings in his normal unilateral manner. Quote, first warning, dot, dot, dot. Third warning, third warning, before directing the sheriff to escort Audra Morgan out of the chambers. And then I watched as a large man violently wrestled a woman half his weight to the ground, smashing her face, handcuffing her. She was standing up in opposition to the murder of a woman's husband, a victim of the authoritarian protocols of a tyrannical and corrupt big pharma system. Board of Supervisors, what is it worth at the end of the day? To sell out to the big pharma and use your leverage over others, to push down your mandates upon the people, to control people's speech, to stand by silently as a woman is wrestled to the ground, wailing. What is it worth to take care of your small little circle and leave out the rest of the people? $10,000, $100,000, $1, dollars Is it worth it to be part of the big club? At the end of a life, you will be left with no money, no control, no power, no elevated status. It's just a question about how you treated people and if you did or did not take a stand for the civil liberties bestowed upon the people, not by man, not by woman, but by the creator, you will have to answer, was it worth it? Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Good morning. Thank you for the mother-daughter proclamation earlier. I am Terry Ann Skelly. I'm a mother of three young adult sons. Many of us are concerned about the mental health of high school students, college students, and young adults in general. I listened to an excellent webinar brought to the medical community entitled, Where Does Cannabis Go in the Body and How It May Affect Teenagers' Brains? The presenter was a highly regarded researcher who's been studying the effects of cannabis compounds on behavior and brains um, since 2000. She described the adolescent brain and the effects of this psychoactive compound, tetrahydrocannabinoid, or THC, the main component of marijuana. She noted that it interrupts the extremely important synaptic pruning that occurs in the brain between early childhood and adulthood and disrupts the excitatory inhibitory balance of neural networks. The resulting negative result is staggering for young adults and the families that care for them. Consider the results if 20% of the county's population under 25 years old uses pot on a weekly basis, and they do. What if it were to go to 30% of the county's population under 25 years? The repercussions of marijuana businesses is that it normalizes marijuana use to teens and young adults as some sort of default choice for stress and anxiety. I support the county's live well vision of building better health, living, safety, and thriving. And I feel that is this vision that will be hijacked by marijuana businesses in the back county. Please keep our children healthy. Thank you. Now hear from the final caller this morning. Uh, happy holidays, Paul Hinkin. On November 15th, Nathan, you had my friend Audra removed from the chamber. Going from first warning immediately to third, might not give enough time to react, especially for those with disabilities, where they may be wondering where the second warning was. One of the deputies cuffed and released her and handling her along the way. Nathan, I have reviewed this situation, taken action, and will tell you now that this is your third and final warning. People will be annoying. We have all been. But no one here should toss rules or protocols out the window 
just because someone else does. An eye for an eye in politics doesn't work. Democracy will not tolerate someone who cannot be bothered to obey the law and repeatedly breaks the rules he made. You have lost control of the meetings. When I clapped for one second between the speakers, you gave a two-minute speech. Who actually disrupted the conduct of the meeting? I have clapped other times. You did nothing. You give some speakers extra time to complete their sentence, but rudely interrupt others at the two-minute mark, right at the two-minute mark. I could go on for hours about the waste of money and stuff you do on equity. Stepping down as chair of the board is not enough. Please resign. The county does not need you. Thanks. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes the request for non-agenda public communication this morning. Again, all the remaining callers will be heard at the conclusion of today's session. Next on our agenda is approval of the statement of proceedings minutes for the regular Board of Supervisors meeting in November 15, 2022, Flood Control District meeting of October 12, 2022, Housing Authority meeting of June 29, 2022, and October 25, 2022, in Horm Supportive Services Public Authority meeting of September 27, 2022 and October 11, 2022, Redevelopment Successor Agency meeting of June 28, 2022, Sanitation District meeting of November 16, 2022, and Fire Protection District meeting of October 11, 2022. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? second. Motion by myself, second by Vice Chair Vargas. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. We'll now proceed with the formation of our consent calendar. Members of the public will have the opportunity to comment on the consent calendar after supervisors have been given the opportunity to remove any items or make any comments. I want to note for today's meeting, item 33 will be heard concurrently with Fire Protection District item number one. Uh, item 25 has been moved from consent uh, to discussion, and we will hear the housing workshop item 30 on Wednesday, time certain at 11 a.m. Uh, or at the conclusion of the land use meeting. Uh, with that, I will go first to Supervisor Anderson. Are there any items you wish pulled or comments you wish to make? <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, on item 12, uh, I don't want to pull it, but I have a, just a quick question of staff, if I may. Uh, the zero, uh, changing our policy from uh, zero tolerance policy, is that because there's state law and we're trying to align with straight, state law on this issue? Chair Fletcher, uh, Supervisor Anderson, and correct, uh, we're out of compliance of the state code and HUD guidelines. And then, uh, and maybe this is too long of a question, so, but uh, with the new policy, will we be able to use that at all as leverage to get people the help they need? If we're talking about people that are um, substance users, um, the rules are against any illicit use of, of drugs. Um, that said, the California Code, though, um, helps us in terms of forcing, or if you will, helping, encouraging people to stay in treatment. And is that they're continuous in treatment, then we can continue to work with them, but they have to be in treatment. Thank you very much. And then uh, lastly, uh, Chairman Fletcher, I'd like to bifurcate uh, the vote on item 20. Uh, all the rest I'm good with. Item 20? Yes, please. No problem, we can do that. Uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Um, yes, thank you so much. I um, have a comment on item two and a question on item 20. Um, so just uh, looking at item two, first of all, I just want to thank the team, um, honestly, for the great work on this. I think um, uh, last year I felt like we had a long way to go uh, in terms of aligning our community corrections partnership plan with you know the objectives that this board has really leaned into over the last couple years. Um, I think this has gone in that direction. I think it's a great plan. It's really thoughtful. Um, I think it really um, identifies um, the investments that we should be focusing on and um, you know diversion programs and how do we expand the diversion programs that we really need to meet the needs of our communities. So. Really just um, wanted to say thank you so much uh, for this work. And we all know that um, for too many folks in our community, um, the, our jails have become really our mental health providers of last resort. And that uh, is something that we as, this, as a board have um, made very clear is uh, stopping, um, you know, day by day and week by week um, as we advance a different paradigm. 
Um, and so just I think this is a really important step forward. I do want to just comment um, that you know I know that um, all these investments um, and really building out the diversion services that we need uh, is is going to take resources. You know I, I'm I'm quite aware that it's going to take resources. So I would just love to be in conversation about what are the additional resources that we will be needing um, to build out the programs um, that where we see gaps in our community. Um, it's it's great that we have a vision about uh, meeting those needs, but it's not going to make a difference if we don't really think about how to resource those investments in those diversion programs. So I'd love to continue our conversation, look at you know what are those gaps in funding, what are the gaps in resources. Um, you know, I'm, everybody doesn't like listening to me say let's uh, spend more money, but we, we might need to. So um, that's all I had to say on that one. So thanks. Um, and then I had a question on. Um, on item 20. Uh, so Chair Fletcher, should I move forward with my question regardless of the bifurcated vote? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is Caroline here or should I ask her? Yep. Hi. Good morning, Chair Fletcher, members of the board. Hi, thank you. Uh, first of all, great work. This is great, really excited. Obviously our um, ledge program um, is a really important tool. Um, if we're not advocating on behalf of San Diego County and Sacramento, um, then we're just uh, taking what's ha handed to us instead of really uh, being a leader in creating the community that um, you know I, I think our constituents demand and deserve. So I just wanted to clarify, it wasn't mentioned, um, confirming that uh, if the county legislative agenda includes uh, our ability to support and advocate for potential legislation that it could increase and expand revenue sources, um, that would support our operational plan, just acknowledging that we will continue be needing to be looking at additional revenue and wanting to make sure that if those opportunities arise where there could be additional um, revenue um, amendments or revenue options on the table, um, that we would be in a position to advocate for them. Absolutely, Supervisor. Thank you for the question. Yes, it's actually a, a guiding principle in both our guidelines and priority sections to seek out all available funding streams and opportunities to provide your board with the flexibility to meet our operational needs. Yeah, just to clarify, just not to seek ones that have already been existed, but also advocate for creating new revenue opportunities. Correct. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Caroline. Appreciate it. Thank you, Supervisor Lawson. Remember, Vice Chair Vargas. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Um, there's just a couple of items that I want to, I have no items to pull. But on item number eight, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to our, our um, homeless housing um, team for all the work that you all are doing on this and your commitment to making sure that our unsheltered communities um, have better opportunities. So I think it's really, really important that we continue to seek additional funding. I was just at the, at the um, uh, homeless uh, you know, conference that we had, and I think there's a lot of excitement and you know, willingness for folks to think outside of the box. And so the more resources we can get, the better. And so I appreciate that. Uh, thank you to the Department of Home Housing Solutions. And then on item number 11, uh, I'm also thrilled that we're actually going to um, be focusing on, you know, really thinking about funding opportunities for our seniors in our region and older adults, um, because we absolutely need extra support and help for that. And uh, I think this, this, these funds will support and improve their lives. And then um, thank you to Caroline, Caroline and her team for all the work on the ledge. Uh, I really appreciate that uh, a lot of the efforts that have been identified are also very much connected uh, to the work that's happening nationally at NACO, to the National Association of Counties as your representative, and also through CSAC um, as your representative as well. I'm really excited about the work that we're going to be doing together uh, throughout this, from homelessness, uh, affordable housing. Um, health care and all of the issues that we think about. And I think what we do differently than many other counties is really think about what the equity uh, impact is. And so I appreciate that. And then last but not least, on item number 21, I know we're going to be adopting today the election results. So I'm very excited about the fact that you got reelected. But I'm also very excited and, and thrilled to say thank you to everyone who worked um, in making these elections um, you know, fair and just for all the people who have never voted or voted for the first time. Uh, we, we have a whole new system and everybody was able to vote by mail and we, we actually saw an increase in the number of people who voted. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of the county workers and all of the volunteers and all of the people who came in and worked um, during the election. Uh, we, don't, we can't have a civil society if we don't have 
people participating in our electoral process. And so I'm just really grateful for all of you and for everything that you do and for, you know, for people who have information or input on how we can always do it better. Um, we really greatly appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, I don't have any items to pull. I want to make brief comments on, uh, on item one. Uh, this is an item brought forward by Supervisor Anderson and myself uh, to evaluate a, a new model for emergency uh, ambulance transportation services in our rural community. Appreciate the partnership of, uh, of Chief Meacham and our, our fire team. Uh, we need to take care of our most vulnerable residents and in the rural communities uh, that is, is dependent upon having a good, reliable uh, EMS and emergency management ambulance service. Um, recent legislation allows the county to designate our fire agency to be the lead ambulance transportation agency and includes the authority to subcontract to both public or private partners. Uh, and I believe that a uh, exhaustive study of these potential changes, we can identify how do we get the best return on investment, not just for the taxpayers, but how do we provide the highest level of service uh, and what capacity we might be able to build out within our fire service. And so today's action uh, to evaluate this model uh, and to bring us back, I think, puts us on a uh, pathway to make sure that we can, uh, we can ensure we provide the highest level of service uh, in the most cost-effective way. And so I'm grateful for all the work to get here, and I look forward eagerly to uh, the results of this and us implementing it. Um, on item eight, our HAP funding, I want to thank Barbara and the team, uh, Nick and everyone, for bringing forward this important item. Uh, the state's HAP funding is uh, really integral in our homeless response. Uh, I had the opportunity to join the governor and supervisors and mayors from around the state uh, last month to talk about this, to talk about how we can continue to strive to do better. Today we're bringing forward our HAP Round 4 funding with the goal of reducing homelessness regionally by 10 percent. We're proposing the allocations of funds towards housing our youth to address homelessness around our youth, community harm reduction teams, uh, and safe havens, and continuing all of the efforts underway to make a meaningful difference in what is certainly one of the most challenging and important regional issues we face. Uh, and then on item 21, uh, an adoption of a resolution declaring the election result of November 8th, 2022. Uh, again, echoing Vice Chair Vargas's comments, thank you to all of our county workers at the registrar, um, the temporary workers, the volunteer workers, everyone who came together uh, to execute an election. And congratulations to everyone who won and our appreciation to everyone who runs, uh, who's willing to uh, be a part of making our communities better. Um, I will note in our county that despite all the differences and challenges and really stark uh, ideological divides we have, we're able to, able to conduct an election. We are able to certify that election. We are able to swear that in and move forward with the confidence that the results reflect the will of the public. And so I appreciate everyone's uh, efforts. With that, I'll make a motion to approve the items on consent. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. All right. We have a motion by myself, second by Supervisor Anderson. We're going to hear from public speakers, and then when we come back, we will take our bifurcated vote on this. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 34 total requests to speak on items on the consent calendar, nine in person, and 25 requesting to speak by phone. Any members of the public that requested to speak on items on the consent calendar, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers. As your name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I'll be calling you in groups of five, so please listen for your name. We'll begin with the speakers in favor of the consent items. Uh, I'd like to invite forward Catherine Rhodes and Crystal Irving. You'll have two minutes to address the board. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Um, hello, Catherine Rhodes, and I believe this is on communications received. And so um, first I want to thank um, Chair Fletcher for all you've done for the homeless. It's been such a big, gigantic change for the homeless and also for the serious mentally ill. When I used to come here, people would say you're not allowed to use county funds for the homeless in San Diego, only the unincorporated. You can't house um, homeless people. Um, but seriously mentally ill in San Diego. You can only house the people in the unincorporated area. That was so terrible. You guys changed that, so thank you very much. In fact, I think that you should run for mayor so that we could actually take care of our homeless problem in San Diego, and I hope you do that. And so um, what I want to talk to you or give you the story is our beautiful waterfront park. So um, how you got it is, um, I forgot the supervisor name, Ron Roberts. He always had this beautiful plan, and they said, if you find the money, we'll let you build it. So I came here one day, looking through your, um, 
your accounts receivable, your, your periodic funds. And I said, you know, there's this fund called the Center City Redevelopment Project Agreement Fund 40115. And Ron Roberts approved it back in 1992 when he was on the city council. And that fund was to end homelessness in downtown San Diego. That fund now has $32 million a year. Every year goes into that fund. And then it gets transferred mid-year into the general fund. So nobody really knows, well, now you're transferring the money into the waterfront park fund, which is fabulous. So I'm glad that it's being used for, for that. But it was really supposed, to, now, now that you have the park, please think about reusing this $32 million a year for the six people, which were um, children, seniors, um, drug and alcohol, people get in out of prison, and general welfare. This money belongs to the poor and it's not going there. Thank you. Thank you. As the next speaker is coming forward, I'd like to invite the speakers in opposition to items on the consent calendar. Kira, Jeff Noway, Michael Brando, Oliver Twist, and Consuelo. If I've called your name, please come forward. Good morning, Supervisors. I'm Crystal Irving, President of SEIU Local 221, which represents more than 10,000 members, including members in detentions in the Sheriff's Department. Uh, we support item number three to ensure that our fingerprinting process is efficient and utilizes appropriate technology. We support giving these critical public safety members the tools they need in the field to be more effective and more efficient. Critical tools that we need to do our jobs better can often be overlooked by senior managers and executives. And this is why it is so critical that the Sheriff's Department welcomes employees input. Last week, we were disappointed to hear that Sheriff-elect Kelly Martinez refused to hear worker voices and has declined to meet with our employees. One of the areas in our recent contract that we were most proud of was the establishment of the Collaborative Solutions Committee, a special committee established for SEIU and the county to meet on difficult issues out of contract cycle. And we've had about five of those meetings so far, and although we haven't always achieved our goals, the meetings have been productive because SEIU and the county tends to leave with a better understanding of each other's perspective. Perspective. So we were shocked when we learned that Sheriff-elect Martinez refused to meet with our members or even authorize her staff to have a collaborative solutions meeting. We have launched a petition and we are here to ask her to reconsider. Part of being a strong leader is walking the walk, and that means taking ownership when you make a mistake. And the fix for this one is a relatively simple one. We are looking to Sheriff-elect Martinez to do the right thing and meet with our members and take a positive step forward as we begin this new working relationship between our members of SEIU and Sheriff-elect Martinez. Again, we are in support of item three. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. My name's Kara. Joel, thank you for the eye contact. That's great. I haven't seen you take your eyes off your phone the entire time. Um, this meeting is a sham, just like all the other meetings are a sham. I'm here to talk about COVID. I don't really like calling it COVID because I don't like calling it anything. You guys have created control and fear throughout this county. The only thing that makes you tyrants is when people are obedient. And I'm not obedient, so you're not a tyrant of me. You're not my leaders. Joel and Jim, Jim's not even here, couldn't be bothered today. Nathan, I'm actually surprised you were able to make it. Did you catch a red eye on a private flight back from the White House last night? Because you were partying with the president, right? The pedophile in chief. You're his mini, right? Prince Cuck of California. Yeah, this, is, this is not on the agenda. About COVID. This is on the Talking about COVID. Items on the agenda. It's, yeah, it's on the agenda. Thank Item you. 10, right? Government doesn't love you. Nathan doesn't love you. None of these people up here love you. None of these people that receive proclamations love you. I've lived here my whole life and I'm watching strangers come in here and steal this county. People claiming to be non-binary and then use the word mother is insane. We are all citizens here. And we're all bowing down to a circus, but you're not my monkeys, not my circus. This isn't my show. You guys shall be ashamed of yourselves. And Nathan, let your family members know that when we come up here online or on social media or in this room and we disagree with you, it's not because we're in love with you, as your wife likes to say to other teams and your brother likes to say to other people online. We're not, we don't have anything like that. We have disdain for you. We're angry. We're ashamed of what you turned our county into. You ruined it. All these people can pretend all they want, but they're all lies. It's all lies. Look it, I have a gavel. I'm Nathan Fletcher. Next speaker, please. I use the name Michael, don't interrupt me, everything ties together. 
when this counterfeit P-A-N-D-E-M-I-C was launched in March of 2020, December 2019, many of us knew that this was the great bifurcation. There were going to be people who would split. More and more people going into delusional psychosis and more and more people aligning and up-leveling up and upgrading to truth. And that is a beautiful thing. I actually want to thank life, creation, God, Yeshua, for actually allowing people like Nathan Fletcher to be in that position. Why? Because when it comes to these things like COVID and people that promote the pharmaceutical company like him, Nick Mascione, Eric McDonald, Wilma Wooten. They're showing what they're really about. And for those who have eyes to see, they can see it. So many people are taking care of their own health. You have no jurisdiction over my bloodstream or my health. I recommend Helen Moore books for you. Goodbye Germ Theory, Ending a Century of Medical Fraud and How to Protect Your Family. Virus Mania. The truth about contagion, exploring theories of how disease spreads. And this is tangentially related to COVID, and I've mentioned it before, Helen, and you're gonna have some time to read since you're retiring. The Psychology of Totalitarianism, Matthias Desmond. Praise God that so many people are waking up and seeing the fraud for what all of you and this is. Here, please. Good morning, Oliver Twist here. Regarding item 20 in your 2023 legislative program, I see you continue to use vocabulary that promotes pseudoscience and flies in the face of bio biological reality. For page B5 of your legislative priorities, you make two references to pregnant individuals. However, in your attempt at some type of inclusiveness, you have quintessentially devalued women and annulled our biological role. And while I'm here, I'm also quickly highlight your behind the scenes switcheroo to the word Latine, which has apparently been deemed a superior replacement for the prior word Latinx. In my research, I discovered that the word Latinx is highly unpopular with the vast majority of Hispanics. I would venture this likely extrapolates to the word Latine as well. As such, the county's actions seem to me to be a case of etymological neocolonization. People from an outside culture imposing their worldview and political will on another. What next, erasing the whole foundational structure of the masculine, feminine, gender-based Spanish language? Your efforts at inclusion seem glaringly in conflict with your stated goal of equity. I urge you to return to using language that honors women and Hispanics instead of opting for pretzel-twisting prose that expunges our core existence. Thank you. As the next speaker is coming forward, I'll invite the final in-person speakers in opposition to the consent items, Audra and Mark. My name is Jeff. I'm gonna speak about uh, COVID, which of course is a global genocidal scam being run largely in part by the World Economic Forum. I'm gonna play for you a short audio clip here by their leader, Klaus Schwab, and one of his minions, Nathan Fletcher. Listen up. When I mention our names, like Mrs. Merkel, um, even uh, Vladimir Putin and so on, they all have been young global leaders of the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. But um, what we are very proud of now is the young generation, like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, president of, Brez of uh, Argentina and so on, so that we penetrate the cabinets. So yesterday I was on a... Oh, shit. Well, you get the point. I missed the end of it. There's a great part there in the end where Nathan starts talking about how it's, it's just a meeting. It's not a movement. It's just a meeting. You're in on it, Nathan. You're all in on it. This is a global takeover attempt with a little genocide mixed in, and you're all in on it. 
You will not succeed, and you will be held to account. You can look down all you want, but you will be held to account. I promise you that. Yeah, Nathan, you. Consuelo, addressing the lies and the liars. Um, yeah, uh, I wanted to talk about the voting and how everything was legit. Just to let you all know who in fact is voting, um, the next person who will be the city attorney of Chula Vista is dead, okay? So that is the ill-informed voting. Okay, those are the people voting for people like you. Um, what else did I want to address? Oh, the homelessness. <laughs> I have four friends who live out of their cars. They are on the front lines speaking on, actually they're exposing the San Diego Police Department and the, the disgusting uh, thing they did with the two mothers and their children taking their cars. You don't care. You don't care, brother. Start caring. Resign. Don't step down. Resign. You're not doing your job. You don't care about the people. None of you guys do. You're all just parroting shit. You're all just, you know, going about the system the way exactly you're told to go about it. You're not making anything better. Um, the few people who do support you are in these chambers. I mean, everybody out there knows who you are. Anytime I mention Nathan Fletcher or this board, it's a laugh or a, oh, fuck. Seriously. So, um, 20 seconds. Almost, oh, another thing regarding homelessness. A woman who attended that conference, I had lunch with her, well not with her, but we ended up speaking, and she was so confused. She's like, I'm just so confused because we have so many programs, like why has it gotten worse? I said, because that's government. Thank you, next speaker please. Mark, the Klaus Schwab video that he was referring to, everyone can see online on YouTube. Uh, it, it's not the exact title, but you'll easily find it if you if you uh, put it on YouTube. Klaus Schwab, Young Global Leaders, audio cleaned up. Um, the first minute and a half, he, he uh, when that cut out, he continues and goes on to say that he's penetrated half the cabinets. And he mentions uh, Canada, France, Argentina. That's from 2017. Um, Nathan is a member of the, the uh, World Economic Forum. They're a global corporation, and it's totally a conflict of interest for you to be in any form of our government. Which item are you um, speaking to? Uh, now, uh, th which directly relates to all of these, th everything you do and pass. Uh, now, number three, fingerprinting could be useful like all technology, however, will probably eventually be used against the people and uh, against protesters or dissidents or anyone else in the field that they just want to print. Armored vehicles is against posse comitatus. Um, that literally, the, the military is not supposed to be used against the civilian population. Um, and obviously it makes tyranny really simple and easy. So you've blurred the lines completely. Housing appointments. Uh, I'm sure you're appointing people to do your Agenda 21 bullshit. Um, uh, I'll talk more about homelessness later. Um, COVID emergency, it's not now, uh, but you want the money, and you, moreover, you want the power it gives you to do unconstitutional things. Neighborhood enhancement, could talk more about that later. Um, uh, oh, and by the way, having two minutes for 24 topics just goes to show you have no respect for the people whatsoever, none. And, and if you cared about public being involved, you'd have the meetings on weekends when people aren't working. You're so full of shit. Next speaker, please. I use name Audra. Why are you to two of you sitting there? That's what's so sad. Everything in this agenda is used to weaponize it against the people. And the fact that you guys can sit up there 
with such arrogance, like you don't care what happens to people. You can't sit there and act like you care about what happens to the people. If that happened to your wife, Nathan, you would be up in arms. Nor if that happened to you, what would you do? Hmm? Tara, Helen, hmm? You guys want to intimidate me to get me out of here, and that's what I'm afraid of for the rest of the people in this county. Because you can take me out, but I'm worried about the rest of the people that are going to have to suffer at your direction. Everything in this is used to weaponize the sheriff and all the military weapons against the people. Plus, you're supposed to give a COVID update. Where's that? You're just putting it in the consent just because you guys want to keep getting your blood money. And you sit here and you talk about, like, <laughs> wanting to help people. It couldn't be more disturbing. Because at your direction, I was drug out like a rag doll. I have a concussion and a bunch of injuries that I shouldn't have. Unless I came in here and waved a gun at you, Nathan, and said, I'm going to fucking kill you. That would warrant it. But nothing I have ever done, I have never been violent. And the fact that you had two deputies standing next to me, what are you going to do to the rest of the people, huh? That's why I come up here every time to expose the fact that you guys are going against the people. Thank you. And authority. Next speaker. The Alberts from the chamber are violating the rules of procedure. It's your first warning. Standing up, Kara, that's your first warning. Audra, that's your first warning as well. Now we will hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you will be unmuted and you will hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd remind the callers that they should mute their TV or live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll start with our first caller. The outbursts from the chamber are interrupting the proceedings of the meeting. Please stop. Our caller, Kathleen Lippett, uh, your device might be muted. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Kathleen Lippett. I, first of all, I'd like to comment on, on compiling all these consent items, many of which need to be separated out so that people can, can opine on them where they find it necessary. It's really troubling to see them all put forth as if they are going to go through without a problem. And when you, when many of them are controversial, uh, Supervisor Lawson Reamer recognized the importance of a of a safe a safety net that protects children. And I also wanted to comment on the, and that is important. Drug-free environments are very important for children. They're important for parents who want to raise children in drug-free environments. The tobacco industry, like the marijuana industry, has made an attempt to infiltrate public health. And without the county recognizing the biased research that they bring before you, mostly anecdotal in the case of the of the marijuana industry, we will continue to go down the road that they want us to, and that is where they want to normalize and, and commercialize and promote drugs because they make a profit for them. Please do not listen to or acknowledge the research that, where, that is, has conflicts of, of economic interests. They are of no value to the public. The public deserves the truth. The public deserves to have to, to be provided with the economic benefits as well as the consequences of drug policies that will make that will make public health problems worse. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Uh, good morning. This is Mark Wilcox. I'm a father, grandfather, and advocate for protecting our youth. 
I oppose item number 12, recommendation three, removing the protection of a drug-free living opportunity in affordable housing. To allow drug-using behavior in affordable housing shields the user from the consequences of his actions, but does not protect anyone around him. Drug use behavior tends to center around using drugs and keeping a steady supply to maintain a user's high. Drug using behavior becomes more important than the need to sleep or eat or to be sympathetic to other housing occupants. The National Household Survey on Drug Abuse indicates that drug use behavior more often results in criminal activities. A person who is addicted might do almost anything, lie, steal, or hurt people to keep using the drug. And they feel anxious, irritable, suicidal, frustrated, and violent with drug use or when experiencing withdrawal from the drug. This drug-using behavior is frightening to children and anyone smaller or less physically or emotionally capable. These vulnerable populations should be our first concern, not those who engage in drug use. We all deserve the opportunity to live in a drug-free environment. Please bring common sense back into enforcing laws. Thank you. Thank you. Now I hear from the next caller. Good morning, item 10, Paul Henkin, happy holiday. On the county's COVID charts, I noticed that you replaced raw numbers per day with a rolling average. These are not numbers, but statistics. Statistics can be manipulated. Raw numbers tell it like it is. And where did the data go for the partially vaxxed? Well, ma. But even with statistics, vaccinated people are dying daily, not occasionally. If the vax worked, this would not happen. One day, Wilma, you will realize that the mRNA you're shot up with is as bad as in the arm, as in the liver, or the other organs where a lot of it stays. So, yes. You will have a lot to answer for, for forcing unwilling people to get the vax and duping most of the rest. The vax is a fraud. Stop pushing it. We need an antidote. Item 20. Um, hope you'll add teaching, counting skills, and adequate fun and power to the list. Um, I like how you emphasized a multifaceted approach. Uh, as a lot of us have been recommending to homelessness. Um, priority is given to environmental justice at the group level, but this needs to be at an individual level. Climate change works on individuals, not groups. Yes, this is a legal issue, not a climate change issue. Data infrastructure is important, but it should not be a priority. Um, it should be integrated into other requests as needed. Um, the pandemic response section is an Orwellian nightmare and needs to be removed. We do not need legislation. We'll now hear from our next caller. Good morning, Chair Fletcher and Board of Supervisors. My name is Becky Rapp. I'm a resident and public health educator here to voice my concern and opposition for item 12. The proposed policy suggesting the remove, to remove the zero tolerance of illegal, illegal drug activity in housing is very deep in the agenda items and then strategically placed on the consent calendar, assuming no discussion was necessary. According to the staff report, the county board is committed to transparency and open government, yet when making such a significant and drastic decision to allow for illegal drug activity in housing, the item is slipped under the umbrella of Health and Human Services Code and Board Policy Sunset Review. Hardly seems transparent as residents have no idea that potentially illegal drug activity will be tolerated at their place of residence. This policy change will only intensify inequality, taking away opportunities for vulnerable residents, including seniors and families with children. 
I ask how permitting drug activity is creating a safe and equitable living environment for all. A government subsidized housing complex in the county encountered this problematic situation when three adult men were using and dealing drugs from their apartment. Drug users from all over the area flocked to the complex looking to get their next fix. Drug paraphernalia was found all over the property, along with violence, vandalism, and thievery. With limited housing options, this change in policy will force those vulnerable to stay in unhealthy and unsafe situations. This board should consider who they're protecting and create a more equitable environment for all. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll hear from the next caller. Hello, this is Kelly McCormick. I'm a public health educator with a focus on youth alcohol, tobacco, and drug prevention. I'm speaking in opposition to item 12, ending the zero tolerance policy for illegal drug activity in county housing. This change would be detrimental to the health and safety of residents who are not drug users. Illegal drug use brings a host of problems and it would be bringing it right into people's homes. Illegal drug buying and selling, violence, firearms, drug paraphernalia, drug overdoses, exposure to fentanyl, normalization of illicit drug use among children and teens. Home should be a safe place. Everyone deserves that right and deserves to be protected from the um, results of illegal drug exposure, as well as smoke, secondhand smoke from things like smoking marijuana. Um, we must do better by protecting the people who just want to live in safety and in peace and not expose their children, their grandparents, people of all ages to illegal drug use at home. Please do more. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Good morning. My name is Teresa Shearson. I care about the victims of violence, especially women and children. National Crime Victimization Survey indicates that about half the victims felt the abuser was under the influence of drugs. By the way, I'm speaking on item number 12. I oppose item number 12, recommendation three, removing the protection of a drug-free living opportunity in affordable housing. Affordable housing tends to be clustered with shared walls, laundry, parking, and public spaces. Affordable housing involves far more mutual respect for other residents than single detached family homes with their own private spaces. Drug using behaviors centers around finding and maintaining drug use at any expense. It supersedes partners, children, anyone who depends on them, neighbors and landlords, all of whom depend on the tenant to be reliable and predictable. Drug using behaviors are unreliable and unpredictable, often impulsive and sometimes volatile, all of which is disturbing to communal living that is often part of affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Actually, I was calling on item 20, which will be heard after this one. Item 20 is on consent. You may continue with your comments. Uh, well, then, good morning. My name is uh, Matthew Adams. I'm calling on behalf of the Building Industry Association here in San Diego County. I first wanted to uh, congratulate uh, Supervisors Desmond and Fletcher for their re-election to the Board of Supervisors. I know there's times you don't agree on everything, but there's no disagreement on your commitment to San Diego. I'm calling on uh, item 20, and in regards to the to the um, item dealing with uh, the affordable housing entity, the local entity that wants to be created, this approach was defeated in the state legislature this year because of broad local opposition, including property owners, business groups, 
and even affordable housing builders, including the Housing Federation, mainly over the concerns over duplicative regulatory nature of the agency, additional costs to those who build affordable housing, and the broad taxing authorities. Now, those concerns remain today. So we ask that the county to withdraw this proposal from its 2023 legislative package and focus on more realistic and comprehensive measures that are also within that document. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hear from the next caller. Dean, um, I'm going to try and talk quickly because there's a lot of issues on the consent calendar and three or four seconds for each one isn't going to do it. So I'm just going to concentrate on a few. Um, with the election results, um, I don't know what's going on, but I put my vote in the ballot box and it came back to me as a mail-in vote, vote. So something sketchy going on with the election. I wanted to make a comment about Audra Morgan. Um, she's like a modern day Rosa Parks. She's standing up for the rights of everybody and she's being brutalized for that. Um, Audra has a Fourth Amendment right to, un to be safe from unreasonable search and seizure. And 18 U.S. Code Section 242 says, whoever under color of law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom willfully suggests any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district to the deprivation of any rights, privilege, or immunities secured or protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States shall be fined or enticed, imprisoned under this section, not more than one year or both, if bodily injury results, um, not more than 10 years, and if kidnapping results, an attempt to kidnap results, um, imprisoned for any term of years or life or both, or may be sentenced to death, um, for the purpose of Section 242, and this is coming from the justice.gov website, acts under color of law include acts not only done by federal, state, or local officials within their lawful authority, but also acts done beyond the bounds of officials' lawful authority. If the acts are done while the official is purporting to or pretending to act the purpose. We'll now hear from the next caller. Hi, Kevin Stevenson. I'm speaking in favor of item 10. Uh, Obviously, we need to make sure that everyone is safe from COVID-19, even as the usual gang of idiots uh, decide to spew their nonsense about this being somehow a, a global genocidal scam or whatever, what's his name said earlier, hilarious. Uh, cases are rising. Hospital beds are filling up. Uh, if you go to your local drugstore, you go to your local CVS, Walgreens, etc., you will notice that they are nearly sold out, if not out, completely sold out, of things like cough syrup and cough drops and Tylenol and other things that people buy over the counter. So people are getting sick. I know a lot of people who have gotten sick, whether it's the flu or RSV or COVID. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Addressing COVID is very important. And then also, I just want to speak in favor of the certification of the election results. I believe that was item 21. Uh, I shouldn't have to speak in favor of objective reality, but uh, we have people in those uh, chambers who like to deny objective reality. So you think, okay, so some of you think the election results were sold. Okay, well, you know that Jim Desmond got reelected in those results, right? Are you saying that Tiffany Boyd Hodgson actually won? I mean, that would be a, an interesting turn of events. But I acknowledge, as someone who voted for Tiffany Boyd Hodgson, that she did not win and that Jim Desmond is the winner of that district. I acknowledge objective reality, and I don't get my underwear in a, in a twist over things that don't go my way. I'm an adult, unlike some people in those chambers. So, anyways... Uh, 
That's all I wanted to say. I just wanted to remind people to mask up. We'll now hear from the next caller. Barbara Gordon. Um, I am opposed to item 12. As someone who works with property managers and tenants, I think retiring that board policy zero tolerance of illegal drug activity and housing is misguided. When drug use or drug dealing is taking place on a property, everyone suffers. The drug user, the tenant, landlord, and neighborhood. Tenants deserve to live in a safe environment. Families need to know that their children can play outside safely. Drug use and drug dealing is a criminal activity and is dangerous and threatening to residents and families. It will also decline property values, particularly when the activity begins affecting the reputation of the neighborhood. We should all ask ourselves if we would want to live next door to a neighbor who is using drugs. We need to empower managers and tenants to keep drugs and other illegal activity off their products. If we care about tenants, we should not allow or tolerate illegal drug activity in housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Yes, this is Peggy Walker. I oppose item 12 because this item shouldn't have been on the consent calendar. It really deserves wide discussion. And one point of discussion is that good policy does not incentivize drug use. It finds a way to interrupt it. While some see item 12 as compassionate, those who've lived the sheer horror of drug use behavior by a family member understand why it's bad policy, unfair, inequitable, inequitable and unreasonable. Item 12 assumes drug use is non-destructive, hurting only the, the user, but this is not true. Family members can tell you it's a long, disruptive, heartbreaking pathway of pain, tremendously costly, often tearing families apart, and often with no resolution. Drug users in an altered state can be dangerous or violent. They don't think of others. Policy may see them as victims, but the people around them are the real victims. Family, neighbors, and children in close proximity are unfairly exposed to drug use, drug dealing, trafficking, haphazardly exposed products. No one wants to use taxpayer money to support dangerous, illegal activities. The two-year-old who swallowed a fentanyl pill dropped in the grass by a careless user didn't deserve that. Please give this the serious consideration it deserves. Illegal drug activity should not be tolerated in public housing. Thank you. Thank you. Now here from the next caller. My name is Jennifer Pankey and I'm in opposition of item number 12. I'm still in shock that we're even discussing this as a possible policy reversal. We're in the midst of a fentanyl epidemic and we're considering going from low barrier to no barrier. As an addict, I cannot tell you how detrimental this would be to mine and the millions of others that are now having their choice of living in a sober environment taken away from them. And for what? Optics? You're thinking that the mentally ill drug addicts would be more willing to get off the street if they were allowed to use drugs? Well, newsflash, news flash, the housing requirements that we've doubled down on have increased the homeless population and the blatant drug use. You want to give them housing paid with our hard-earned money. I don't know what experts you're talking to, but I'm a subject matter expert as a formerly homeless drug addict, and this approach does not work. Stop lowering the bar in the hopes that if you make it low enough, it might work. These are suffering human beings that can and do recover if given the opportunity to rise to the occasion. This is not a compassionate approach to solving homelessness because this will continue to force the homeless population into the community instead of the beaches that will be our low-income communities, which reside in the community. They say it's discrimination to hold people accountable for their sobriety and criminal activity while it's discriminating to the majority of the community who want safe, clean, and criminal-free environment. San Diego can do better. Stop pushing this agenda and start thinking outside the box. Let the formerly homeless recovering addicts make policies, not the council and not the so-called experts with no lived experience. Thank you. 
Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. My name is Maggie Graham, and I am 13 years old, and I oppose item number 12. I know many of you are probably wondering what a 13-year-old has to say about this issue, but I've had a lot of experience in my 13 years of life. Drugs have ripped apart my family, and I was taken from my mother at a very young age because she was using drugs. Both of my parents were addicts, and I was caught in the crossfire of their addiction. I learned very early on the horrible effects that drug use has on families and the person who uses drugs. My parents weren't bad people, but they did bad things under the influence of drugs. And my mom was able to go to rehab and get sober and was able to get custody of myself and my sister. After she was finished with rehab, she didn't have anywhere else to go. But she was able to find a housing program with zero tolerance drug policies and has remained sober ever since. My dad, however, went to rehab and went to housing that was flexible with the sobriety requirements. And he eventually signed over custody because he couldn't stay clean and sober. I'm forever grateful that my mom was able to have this choice and chose me, but I can't help thinking about how different my life might be if my dad could have had that same foundation. My dad is still in his addiction and is in low-income housing. He has no incentive to do anything different because there are no consequences for him. My sister and I have a very beautiful life today with my mom, and I am begging you not to take that choice away for a recovering addict. You cannot put active drug users in housing with people that are trying not to use drugs. Again, I am only 13 years old, and this is a really bad idea. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Hi, good morning. This is Melanie Woods with the California Apartment Association. We represent over 50,000 members statewide with over 2 million units of market rate and affordable housing. I am here today on item number 20, the legislative program. We respectfully request that you carve the San Diego Regional Housing Finance Entity out of your program today. San Diego is facing a housing crisis, but the creation of an unchecked and duplicative housing agency is not the answer. Many of the tools this entity would use, including special taxes and bonds, are powers that the county and city already have. A new entity is not the answer for San Diego. We recognize the county has finite resources for advocacy, and we ask that you spend them on other important important priorities in this legislative program. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hear from the next caller. Richard Golden, item 10. Dr. Wooden, we need many case investigations on all cases, including rapid tests, to get data on reinfections and if Novavax is more effective than mRNA. How many Novavax have even been given? We need to use the most effective, safe vaccine, not just Pfizer. We also need data on the next 10,000 all-cause deaths and hospitalizations by age group and four separate subcategories based on COVID infections, reinfections, and vaccination status. The long COVID is causing the damage, but we need to see the data, more data. There is no treatments available for anybody because of too much demand. We can only treat if the case rates are under 2.0. How many treatments per week are even available to be prescribed in the county? We also need to sponsor antibody testing for certain purposes, one of which is to see why some people are having bad vaccine reactions. We need to focus more on prevention and infections than vaccines. We need entrance metering requirements, air quality requirements, county controlled rapid testing and breathalyzer events at the potential super spreading venues, free N95 masks, COVID safe school programs, eliminate DMV and jury duty COVID parties, and indoor masking requirements, even if only 50% will comply. We need free N95 masks for those that want them. Even if we reduce some of the chains of transmission, that will be better than not reducing any. The long-term technology we need is the sensor masks being developed at a university in Shanghai. We need to utilize them in classrooms, healthcare settings, and other places and set up a network with an information center. 
These can be used to eliminate transmission while it is happening. Again, we re we'll now hear from the next caller. Hi, yes, my name is Brittany Powers. I oppose item number 12. I heard earlier that you stated that this policy is to remain in compliance with state law. I'm asking San Diego to stand apart and stand up for the recovering addicts that this will affect. You have talked about increased funding opportunities, but as well have learned over the years that increased funding doesn't mean a decrease in human suffering. We don't have to do this. Addicts in recovery need accountability and a strong foundation to build their lives on and to, and to secure their families and also their children's lives. As a woman in recovery, I oppose item number 12. People need security, a stable foundation, and accountability to live their lives and to give their children the life that they deserve, respect, and need. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll go to the next caller. Item two is moving felons from prison to county jail. Item three, a mobile fingerprint ID system to collect data for the federal government computers, costing $3 million. Item four, is the sheriff's buying a compact armored truck that can be equipped with armored plating, ballistic glass, and a variety of unnamed attachments for $436,000 using the Urban Area Security Grant. Security ain't rescue. Item six, a DHS grant for terrorism and catastrophic events for over $4.1 million. Who are the terrorists? Item seven, partnering with extremists sdg &E to accept their $200,000 donation to the fire council to spray toxic long-term fire retardant on the roadside. Item eight, a $12.8 million grant using the excuse of homelessness. Item 11, over $4.1 million in grants from the California Department of Public Health. Item 12, illegal drug activity and housing is now okay, but fentanyl is bad. Items 14, 15, and 16 are the supervisor spending over $803,000. Item 19, about $20.6 million to be made in housing production from City Venture, plus $3.4 million in interest. Item 20, it seems all the Office of Economic Development and Government Affairs does is tell these supervisors to kiss the boots of the state and federal governments in exchange for money buckets. Item 21. Maybe this is where the Register of Voters emergency ballots come into play because certainly no one in their right mind voted for Nathan. Item 23. More conflict of interest codes that are blatantly disregarded by all of these supervisors. Item 27 is a total of 30 bad choices. Item 10, not even these supervisors care about COVID anymore. That's why it's in the consent. It's, we're sort of losing credibility, I think, with, with the people. Yes, you are. We're done. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. This is Ann Riddle speaking. I'm speaking in opposition to item 12. This is a misguided effort to remove this board policy to put it in alignment with what the state is requiring of affordable housing. The state does not take it as far as what would happen by retiring this board policy. The state is just interested that people in treatment have a fair playing field when trying to seek affordable housing. It is not asking for requiring or enabling drug using behavior to occur in affordable housing. The removal of this board policy will do just that. And let's make sure we understand what drug using behavior looks like. If you don't have it as part of the circumstances around which you have to do business or live, you probably don't realize how difficult it is for people to live around drug using behavior. I think it's also important to recognize that the main mantra in treatment is that people with drug using behavior have to lose something before they will get into treatment. And that's not gonna happen if we enable them to have housing no matter what their behavior. There's a cost for behavior that hurts others and losing housing is that. So if our real goal is getting people into treatment, removing, enabling, allowing, 
drug use behavior in housing is going to interrupt that trajectory into good treatment programs. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from our final caller. Phone callers, Diane Grace, your device might be muted. Good morning. I wanted to speak on non-agenda. Am I too okay. early? Yes, we'll come back to you at the conclusion of today's session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes the public comment on the items in the consent calendar. Thank you. We have a motion by myself, seconded by Supervisor Anderson. Our first vote will be on item 20. So the first vote will be uh, on item 20, a standalone vote on this item. Uh, please vote. <coughs> Chair Fletcher, that motion passes with Supervisor Anderson voting no. All other supervisors who are present voting aye. We have a motion by myself, second by Supervisor Anderson for the remaining items, uh, remainder items on consent. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors who are present voting aye. We will take up item 25, auditor and controller appointment of to retiree rehire position. I'll make a motion to approve. Is there a second? second. We have a motion by myself, second by Vice Chair Vargas. Let me ask the clerk to call forward any public speakers in this item. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have six requests to speak on item 25, one in person and five requesting to speak by phone. Also note for the record that we received two e-comments on this item, both in opposition. Any members of the public that requested to speak on item 25 by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speaker, uh, the speakers in opposition to this item. I'll invite Audra to please come forward. You have two minutes to address the board. Go ahead, thank you. All right, good. Surprise there's not another officer sitting next to you. It's crazy. Um, yeah, so you want to uh, rehire this person because of your integrated and highly complex property tax system. While we're talking about homelessness, you're raising property taxes. It's so great. Because you really want to help the people, don't you? <laughs> I see it in everything you do. Um, but you want to pay this person $51,634 for 120 days. Because you've made this, and you knew that she wanted to retire on December 15th. So why would you give her the lead on this property tax stuff. Just seems a little weird that if you know this person's gonna retire, why would they be working on such a crazy project that you'd have to come and rehire them for four months? Is that gonna be long enough for her to explain this system and teach enough people about it? Hmm? All while you raise the taxes of the people and be like, why are they homeless? It's so weird, it's super, I mean. <laughs> has nothing to do with us raising their taxes. <sighs> I mean, right? Right, because everything you guys do is so righteous. It's good. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be, thy, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Deliver us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Sorry, I got a concussion. I can't even say this shit right. But... It's good. You guys sit up there, I'll help. We'll now hear from those that requested to speak by phone. When it is your turn to speak, you'll be unmuted and you'll hear a recording that will tell you to begin your comments after the beep. I'd remind the callers they should meet their TV live video stream before they begin speaking. We'll start with our first caller.
Uh, yes, am um, I Paul Hinken? I believe um, pretty much all I had to say was um, thank you for removing this from the uh, consent calendar. Um, all appointments, I think, should be in discussion items since these are public servants. Uh, they're going to be serving the people for an un for I don't know how long and um, you know it's something that the people should discuss openly um, they should at least be given the opportunity to discuss it openly um, and you know if maybe maybe there is nothing to discuss maybe the person is good maybe the person uh, Maybe the person has no objection, um, but, you know, at least people had the chance to comment. Now, in this case, um, I really don't know why you'd want to rehire someone who wants to retire. Um, I mean, sounds crazy to me, but anyway, it's all good. Happy holidays. Uh, Thanks for listening. Thank you. I'll hear from the next caller. Dean, I want to talk about rehiring this auditor. As the last caller pointed out, why would you want to rehire somebody who wants to retire? And also, with all the financial waste and all the problems with the county and with all the board of supervisors not following the laws, violating U.S. laws, violating U.S. Environmental Protection Act. We need an auditor who's going to actually look at these things and make sure that the board of supervisors is doing what they need to do and not just rubber stamping what's going on. So. I guess it's not a good idea to ask you guys to hire somebody who would actually hold you accountable because that's not what you guys do. But I think it's important that we hire an, aud an auditor who's fair and who's got the people's back and not to there who's just to rubber stamp what's going on. And possibly that's why you guys want to hire somebody who's retiring rather than getting in a new auditor who you don't know who how they're going to act and what they're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Hey, it's Truth. I think rubber stamp sounds just about right. I'm going to have to agree with that. Allegedly, Nanita de Jesus made about $159,000 a year in 2018 as principal accountant for the county of San Diego. Now the item says Nanita is needed again for a retiree rehire position as an IT analyst in the auditor and controller department to complete highly complex information and technology work relating to the integrated property tax system project. Apparently no one else can do this job for 120 days. This item's fiscal impact statement says Nanita will get paid, quote, $51,634 for the auditor and controller department, which reflects a maximum of 120 workdays slash 960 hours for the retiree rehire, in quote. So maybe not even 120 days, and she'll get to collect an over $50,000 check from San Diego County taxpayers. That reminds me of retiree rehiree Susan Green, who was previously a chief information officer for the county. When researching her, I found she had pushed fascist public-private partnerships and in 2013 supported digital access sharing of people's legal information via the Justice Electronic Library System. And it was thousands and thousands of taxpayer dollars she paid. She got paid for just a few weeks of work. The excuse was the same, that no one else could do the complex IT pencil pushing. I say let's keep these people retired and keep them as far away from any type of gov government position as we can. Same thing as for all of you supervisors. You can just go resign, you know. You don't, Nora, you don't have to become the chair. I mean, I, I look forward to it, but you don't have to do it. 
But it's better than Nathan. I actually, you know, I kind of like you a lot more than Nathan. But you don't have to do this. You can all just resign. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on item 25. Thank you. We have a motion by myself, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas to approve item 25. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We're going to go to agenda item number 28, receive an update on declaring a list in fentanyl public health crisis, add staff years, approve use of ARPA plan funding and authorize application for future funding opportunities. We'll turn it over to staff for the presentation. Before staff begins our presentation, I'll note for the record that an errata was distributed to the board and posted online on Friday for the public that removed recommendation number five as funding tied to the 14 staff years will not come from the American Rescue Plan Act. Thank you. And good morning, Chair Fletcher, members of the board. Thanks to your support and leadership, our county is prioritizing a robust response to the crisis of fatal overdoses that has impacted way too many people of all ages in our region. Today's item is a follow-up to your board's uh, direction on June 28th of this year, declaring illicit fentanyl as a public health crisis and directing staff to develop recommendations and an implementation plan to address illicit fentanyl as a public health crisis and explored research funding to be used to support a comprehensive approach to fentanyl misuse prevention and harm reduction efforts, including local efforts to check the local drug supply for the presence of illicit fentanyl and reduce its availability. We are very proud of the recommendations and the initial plan we're putting forward today, which we believe will save countless lives with evidence-based interventions. Joining me is Drs. Wilma Wooten, Luke Bergman, Cameron Kaiser, and Nicole Esposito. Dr. Cameron Kaiser, our county's public health officer, and Dr. Nicole Esposito, our behavioral health services chief population health officer, will provide an overview of this item and the implementation plan. Starting off is Dr. Kaiser. Thank you, Nick. As has been articulated previously to your board, the opioid epidemic has been devastating the nation, including San Diego County, since the late 1990s. From 1999 to 2019, nearly 500,000 Americans died from an overdose involving prescription or illicit opioids. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, this progressive and exponential rise in op opioid overdose deaths in the United States can be linked to three distinct waves over the past two decades. The third wave, which we are currently in, began in 2013 with significant increases in synthetic opioid overdose deaths, including illicit fentanyl. From 2016 to 2021, the drug overdose death rate among San Diego residents increased by 134% for all drug overdoses shown in blue, 203 percent for opioid overdoses shown in orange, and over 2,000 percent for fentanyl overdoses in green. When examining the data stratified by age, we see that 25 to 35-year-olds shown in yellow had the highest fentanyl overdose death rates from 2017 to 2021, while 46 to 59-year-olds in blue had the highest increase over time. Finally, when we look at the data by race and ethnicity, we see marked differences in the effects of the opioid epidemic by racial and ethnic groups. From 2017 to 2021, the opioid overdose death rate increased by 392% for Hispanic Latino residents, shown here in blue, 401% for black African American residents in dark blue, and 120% for white residents, shown in light green. These figures are striking, but under the leadership of your board, the Health and Human Services Agency has been working to address this crisis, and with today's proposed strategies, we'll be taking this work much further. Actions to addressing the local illicit fentanyl crisis are supported by activities currently occurring, which include the Overdose Data to Action, or OD2A grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Pending Opioid Settlement Framework, and the Population Health Steering Committee, which includes the County of San Diego Harm Reduction Strategy. HHSA is one of the recipients of the Overdose Data to Action Grant awarded by the CDC in September 2019 with a focus on surveillance and prevention strategies and activities aimed at reducing opioid misuse and opioid use disorder and increasing access to evidence-based treatment. OD2A fits into the CDC's broad framework to address the opioid crisis based on five key strategies. Conduct surveillance and research, build state, local, and tribal capacity, support providers, health systems, and payers, partner with public safety, and empower consumers to make self safe choices. This is a joint effort between behavioral health services and public health services, and this grant funds public health jurisdictions to collect high-quality, 
comprehensive and timely data on non-fatal and fatal overdoses and conduct prevention efforts informed by these data. The opioid settlement framework will also support reduction of the fentanyl crisis through education and research, harm reduction, and treatment. And in response to your board's direction, with an understanding of the value of harm reduction principles and the need for an interdisciplinary approach, in 2021, HHSA established the Population Health Steering Committee, a joint effort between behavioral health services and public health services, as well as other HHSA departments. A major initiative put forth by this committee is the County of San Diego Harm Reduction Strategy, which is divided into four strategic domains, cross-sectoral convening, workforce, healthcare, interaction, healthcare integration and access, and housing. Efforts proposed to address the fentanyl crisis align with this committee's outlined strategies. And the healthcare integration access domain of this strategy has a focus on harm reduction strategies to prevent drug overdoses, including naloxone distribution and syringe service programs, address drug use and abuse, and prevent the spread of infectious diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C. Throughout all of this work, the county has still faced major challenges in responding to overdose spikes. What we don't traditionally do is just start calling each other to coordinate a response. We know this costs us time and may cost us lives. And the last recommendation before you today will establish a first in California cross-departmental unit which we will be able to surveil in near real time clusters and overdoses and spikes and will assist the county in responding in a coordinated way. This work saves lives that are at risk and protects lives that might be lost in the future. And today we are building on this existing work with the following four strategies proposed to address the illicit fentanyl crisis. Strategy A, to conduct an overdose prevention education. Strategy B, to expand the naloxone distribution program. Strategy C, to intervene early with individuals at highest risk for overdose. And strategy D, to improve the detection of overdose outbreaks to facilitate more effective response. All four strategies outlined here are in line with the CDC overdose to action grant strategies the county harm reduction strategy, and the opioid settlement framework, all of which are data-driven and rooted in the pursuit of equity. Please welcome Dr. Nicole Esposito to provide a detailed description for these strategies. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Our first strategy is overdose prevention education. These efforts have been well underway. The first illicit fentanyl awareness campaign ran from, from August to December 2021. There were billboards and ads in six different languages viewed nearly 10 million times throughout San Diego County. The campaign also included social media ads which connected individuals to our website where they could further their knowledge and understanding about illicit fentanyl, naloxone, and overdose prevention. As previously directed by this board, youth-centered substance use prevention efforts are in motion. These include implementation of Project Alert, an evidence-based substance use prevention and life skills curriculum through a contract with the, with the San Diego County Office of Education. Youth-led conversations around prevention and illicit fentanyl risks. Regional fentanyl presentations and naloxone training for parents and community coalitions and a youth-focused illicit fentanyl media campaign set to launch by the end of this year. Our next strategy is naloxone distribution. In July 2022, we launched a regional naloxone distribution title, program titled San Diego Overdose Education and Naloxone Distribution, which includes targeted naloxone outreach and training efforts, partnerships with community-based providers, and implementation of a total of 12 naloxone vending machines across each of the HHSA regions. We anticipate the arrival of the first vending machine for placement at McAllister Institute South Bay Regional Recovery Center early 2023. At this board's recent direction, we are now in preliminary discussions with local colleges and universities to ensure naloxone access for youth. When onboarded, these colleges and universities will be part of our naloxone distribution network, which ensures easy access to naloxone and will en enable data collection. Additionally, we have the Naloxone Emergency Medical Services, or EMS, Leave Behind Program, which is a collaboration between public health and public safety, allowing EMS personnel to leave naloxone on scene with patients and their support systems, providing it directly to those who need it most. As of July, the county EMS office has authorized the distribution of leave behind naloxone kits and education to 911 callers, and we're pursuing similar opportunities with additional first responders. 
We are also working to make naloxone accessible within county jails, as we know that this increases safety and health care for individuals that are incarcerated. In June 2022, the Sheriff's Department began placing naloxone kits in common areas of housing units, as well as day room and visitation areas in county jails with accompanying training videos shown during the booking process and in the housing units. This enabled people that are incarcerated to have access to medications when a deputy is not in the immediate area. The Sheriff's Department also provides vouchers for naloxone to people at risk of opioid overdose upon release from jail back into the community. All these actions are meant to encourage more people to carry naloxone. Our strategy is to increase widespread access to naloxone while ensuring that those that, need, that most need it have easy access to it. Our next strategy aims to intervene early for individuals that are at highest risk, such as those who have recently experienced a non-fatal overdose. With this board's approved opioid settlement action, planning is underway to develop a peer specialist service model that offers outreach and engagement to individuals in emergency departments who have just experienced a non-fatal overdose. Services will emphasize engagement and strategies focused on de developing tailored overdose response plan, naloxone training, and exploring strategies to reduce the risk of another overdose. Using this peer model, specialists will foster ongoing relationships that are respectful, collaborative, and cement the connections between people who use drugs and the services that can help them survive and thrive. Now, moving to our next strategy to improve overdose outbreak detection and response. In our current state, we are reacting to overdoses without efficient procedures or the right tools to determine the significance of a community overdose cluster report. These inefficiencies not only cost time, but they may make a difference in our ability to save lives. Today's action is exceptional by establishing a new multidisciplinary county overdose unit under the leadership of Dr. Seema Shaw from Public Health Services and team members from both Public Health Services and Behavioral Health Services. This unit will also work with the EMS staff who will, support, who will facilitate and support countywide integration of an overdose mapping and application program known as OD Maps, which will capture data, time, location of overdoses through already established first responder data. Additionally, this strategy includes efforts to increase access to drug checking services, also known as pill testing or adulterant screening, particularly through harm reduction organizations by integrating and implementing drug checking services into the county's existing regional syringe service program planning work. And finally, today's recommended, recommended actions are as follow. Receive the update on declaring illicit fentanyl as a public health crisis. Add a total of 20 staff years for positions across behavioral health services, public safety group, county fire emergency medical services, and public health services to support various overdose prevention, surveillance, and response activities. And lastly, authorize the agency director to apply for additional funding opportunities as needed. We look forward to returning to your board to report back on our progress as we implement this plan. We'll now take any questions. Thank you. Uh, let's hear from our public speakers and then we'll come back to the board. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. We have 12 total requests to speak in item 28, five in person and seven requesting to speak by phone. Also note for the record that we receive one e-comment uh, neutral to the recommendation. Any members of the public that requested to speak in the setting by phone, please dial into the conference line now using the instructions that were provided to you. We'll begin with the in-person speakers, starting with those in favor of this item. As your name is called, please come forward and stand against the east wall under the murals until it is your turn to speak. I'd like to invite forward Oliver Twist and Catherine Rhodes. As they're coming forward, they'll be followed by the speakers in opposition to this item, Audra, Mark, and Michael Brando. You'll have two minutes to address the board. I'll ask you to please state your name for the audio record. Good morning, Oliver Twist here. Uh, first, thank you for introducing yourselves. It was noticed and appreciated, so I do appreciate that. Um, it's very heartening to see you now moving in the right direction uh, for, with recommendation three, an overdose mapping application and program, but I'm hoping the data will be made available in real time to the public. 
Uh, thank you for showing the slide, Andrew. Also, I urge you to adopt a form or far more comprehensive and timely tracking system, which it sounds like you're on the road to doing. This is one I've created myself just with Google Maps and uh, dropping the pin from uh, the newspaper articles and such, but I think it's really critical. Um, while I previously mentioned zip codes in my prior request for mapping, I think we need to see geo-specific addresses and 100 blocks for private residences, where the deaths are occurring so we can map them out. It will also show us where dealing and drug deliveries are occurring and help with investigations as well. Uh, so thank you for showing that map, and that's kind of what I have in mind. So creating the map gives transparency and showing where deaths are occurring. It also upholds your value of equity, demonstrating what neighborhoods and streets are being affected. It would also likely prove, prove useful for investigative purposes. I urge you to do more to highlight where the devastating consequences of this chemical warfare is happening. Fentanyl is a grave existential threat to human life and is devastating our greatest resource of all human potential. Thank you. Um, hello, Catherine Rhodes. And what I wanted to talk about was um, the amount of people that are homeless that die from fentanyl. The first time I ever remember this being a problem, I remember like um, a whole bunch of people, homeless people just dying on the street. And we're like, what's going on? And then somebody said, I think somebody's poisoning them. And that was a couple of years ago. And it's literally poisoning people. Um, so anyway, I'm not sure if you know, but in seven years from 2014 through 2021, there's been a 907% increase in homeless deaths each year. For example, in 2014, there was 55 people who died. 2021, 499, we'll just call it 500. And I do remember before when I saw other documentation, I can't find it right now, that um, over 100 of the 500 people that were homeless that died this year, or was I think a lot more than that, um, died from fentanyl poisoning. And so this is really hurting the, um, the homeless community. I really do agree with the mapping. I think that's perfect. I think that would be great. Um, you know, I think that, you know, even the, the, the bots that they have on Twitter where somebody um, gets hurt from, um, you know, Vision Zero for bicycles or they get in accidents, we have it now, um, you know, on the internet. I think for these, um, these fentanyl th um, deaths that you could show those too. And I think what you'll find is all the poor people in, um, that are homeless that have no hope are dying. And um, so this is a good step forward. I'm very glad you're doing it. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Audra, Mark, or Michael Brando, please come forward. Use the name Audra. Dr. Death, what about COVID? Nothing. That's an emergency, but we're talking about a crisis. I'm glad you're here. Good to know. Love your propaganda updates as usual. Um, it's just interesting to me that it's like, let's find all of these ways to inform the public of the drugs and, um, you know, whatever else BS that you're doing, but instead of closing the border, it's like, why would you do that? Why would you stop the drugs from coming in, right? Because, I mean, and you wouldn't be paid to do this. You wouldn't be able to create your programs. Right? It's like, so I mean, that would be stupid. I mean, because we're trying to help people here, right? Right. It's like everything is upside down. That's why I know what God you guys serve. Because what are you trying to do to the people is deceive them when you could stop the problem from happening. But that, that doesn't make sense, right? How would you do that? I don't know. Would you tackle somebody to the ground? Hmm? No, because you don't want to do that to other people, just people who want to make things right in the county. It's good. It's so good. Love it. Love it. it smells like sulfur in here, for sure. I feel pretty hot, like, right next to you guys. 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Thank you. Lead us. Next speaker, please. Your time is up. Next speaker, please. Next speaker, your time is up. Next speaker. Mark, you could have given her a few more seconds for the Lord's Prayer. Um, so, uh, education, uh, probably a good idea, but any parent knows telling a kid not to do something doesn't work very well. Um, the idea of set, uh, setting up uh, distribution like vending machines uh, for Nexalon, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, 12 of them in the entire county, the chances of anyone dying is not going to be on the right block, and they die pretty quickly. There's no way whatsoever that you're going to stop the problem without securing the border completely and totally. What none of these people know is that when Trump signed the USMCA, and Biden never rescinded it. Remember, he rescinded all this stuff, uh, all of Trump's executive orders. He didn't rescind this, and neither one of them ever told you that Chapter 30 signed control over trade and immigration to a foreign unelected council, that we only have one American member on that's not elected by any of us, and is no doubt a globalist. So um, they want people to come over the border. Uh, in Texas, the, the latest news story, mainstream news, Texas, 16,000 people came over in a day, like last night. Um, 8,000 a day. We can't even afford this. But it's all part of a plan to just globalize us and get rid of our borders altogether because USMCA stands for United States Mexico Canada Agreement, the North American Union, like there's a European Union. So, anyway, if you don't secure the border, there's no chance whatsoever that you're going to stop the problem. More people are going to die, and your corporation is going to keep ma making money off it. You should be ashamed. You should. <laughs> You should stop doing what you're doing and working for the globalist and fucking help the people. I don't know how the hell you live with yourselves. The problem is going to get much worse as you make more money. Final call for Michael Brando. We'll now hear from the individuals that requested to speak by phone. We'll start with our first caller. Uh, hello, Paul Hinton, item 28. The strategies on the list at attachment A are a good starting point, but they're not good enough. An overlooked strategy is that no one in the county should be exempt from subpoena search or similar actions to detect fentanyl or other opioids used illegally. If you're serious, no one should be exempt as we've heard from, uh, among others, the Citizens Law Enforcement Review Board. If you're not, um, it will find its way in with an exempted person, just as it seems to be now, in the jails at least. A dangerous source of fentanyl overdoses is the drugs, the doctors themselves over prescribing the stuff. This needs to be addressed, as well as rogue agents like drug dealers who lace their products with fentanyl. Fentanyl is 100 times as potent as morphine. If it is so ridiculously powerful, and if anyone could pick it up or OD on it, and that includes children, many of whom test new stuff just by touch or taste, why on earth is anyone prescribing it? But now it's worse. Now you have a third wave of opioid deaths, mainly synthetics now from non-medical people mostly. Monkey see, monkey do. I mean, that's been the way for hundreds, thousands of years. We don't need to call fentanyl public health crisis. There's enough to call it illicit or illegal. The problem is terrible, and I'm glad someone here is doing something about it. But calling the crisis sort of cheapens the meaning of that term, since it doesn't really affect that. We'll now hear from the next caller. Yeah. 
Hi, this is Cynthia. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Um, sorry, um, I'm really sick. Um, uh, it's probably from my fourth booster. Um, just kidding. I didn't take that. My body knows how to heal. But um, my heart breaks to hear these stories of young children, um, just anybody that's dying from this drug. And although I can, I want to say I appreciate those that are in a profession to help us figure this out. Um, it's really common sense. And for us little folks that are witnessing our borders being destroyed, our constitution being destroyed, and our values being destroyed from those in office that do not honor the constitution, this is sickening. And it's very, very simple to close the borders and to protect our rights here as citizens. I hope you can understand that. I highly doubt it, but my prayer is I hope you can understand that. Close the borders. It's very simple. We're getting destroyed by this crap. Thank you. Thank you. Now hear from the next caller. Hi, this is Dean. I wanted to talk about um, the idea to reduce the opiates. It sounds like a very good idea, but we also need to look at what's going in, on in the hospitals. I used to rent a room at a house with elderly people, and they went into the hospital, and when they said no to a surgery, they brought out the opiates. Um, there was another lady who got constipated, and they put her on opiates to stop everything, and then they wanted to force her to have surgery. And then when she said no, they said, no, you can't decide because you're on these opiates and can't decide. So I think naloxone would be something appropriate for people in the hospitals who want to make their own decision. This is also going on with the people on ventilators who are brought into the hospital for COVID because they're given opiates and they're basically killed with these opiates. So dealing with opiates is a very good idea, but we also need to look at it in the medical profession. The other thing is we need to look at why people are dealing with opiates, not just the opiates, because when you lock people down, you separate people, you stop children from being with their friends, of course they're going to want to do something to deal with that, and they turn to things like opiates, which are not very good. Um, opiates need to be addressed, but we need to address the reasons, for example, like doctors just prescribing opiates. So it's not just a matter of the illicit opiates that we need to look at. We need to look at the opiates that are going on in the medical profession and the hospital and look at all opiates because it's not just an isolated thing. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from the next caller. It's true. This 1980s war on opioid drug three hash fentanyl was destined to be declared public health crisis number 58. And we all know why. Summer Stefan Wilma Wonka, get those money buckets ready. It's going to rain federal Biden inflation debt dollars soon. If you need help on the technical aspects of collection, allow me to recommend free money, Joel. The item says there will be an overdose mapping and application program that will capture date, time, and location of overdoses through first responder data. Good to know everyone's data is private. Japanese company Daiichi Sankyo's patented drug naloxone will be paid for with drug money for $5.5 million from opioid settlement funds. And there will be $4.8 million in American Destruction Plan Act funds redirected from COVID. From one emergency to the next, Consuelo called it on June 28th. Just call it COVID and you will get all the funds you need for it, Summer. And there's more. Overdose data to action grants from the CDC to accelerate spending of substance use block grant funding and contribute to planning of the opioid settlement framework. More federal entanglement and a sustainably, resiliently poor future for all. But will all this money actually change anything if the source isn't capped? What do you think, Summer? Um, so we just met with Dr. Gupta, Nick and I. He came to San Diego. He's the national drug control policy for President Biden. This is the bottom line that I told Dr. Gupta. We need to stop the flow of fentanyl. 
Nah, just brainwashing. Using the opioid money, which I think to to constantly handle messages and, and to do it every day. Every single day, brainwash. But change is nothing. Just check. Thank you. And Chair Fletcher, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. We've obviously spent considerable time as a county uh, trying to address issues of substance abuse. We know uh, it's not just San Diego. Across the nation, communities are struggling to treat addiction. Uh, there was a, a pretty extensive seven-part series in the Washington Post talking about the history of this issue uh, and the reality that in order to stem the loss of life, uh, we need to do everything that we can to meet those individuals uh, who are in a state of crisis and help them get out. Um, opioid overdose races are increasing. Uh, we know this is a year-over-year -year issue, but with a sharp increase uh, in recent years as fentanyl has become the leading cause of death. Uh, we're also aware of the complicating factors of fentanyl lacing other substances that people do, uh, often leading people to add an opioid addiction to an already existing uh, addiction they faced with another substance. As a public health crisis and as a board, we've taken uh, engagement. I think every member of this board has been involved in one action or another um, related to this. And so to see us uh, begin to put forward uh, consistent with the framework that we adopted around the uh, expenditure of opioid settlement funds, uh, I think is a really positive step forward. I'm certainly uh, completely supportive of everything in here, the public health messaging, the Narcan distribution, the rapid response to overdose outbreaks. Uh, I want to thank Supervisor Lawson Reamer, Supervisor Desmond, the district attorney, uh, for bringing forward the effort to declare fentanyl a public health crisis. Uh, Supervisor Anderson for partnering for us to put the framework around, around how we fund it and Vice Chair Vargas for all of her efforts uh, in helping us confront this. I think coming together, we can give the attention the full crisis it deserves uh, and really hopefully begin to see some progress. And so with that, I'm pleased to make a motion uh, to approve the recommendations in item 28. And we have a second by Vice Chair Vargas. We'll go to Vice Chair Vargas. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, the only thing I would add is that I just, I am very interested in uh, specifically, I mean, there's a lot of work being done around this, but Particularly, um, I had a briefing with the folks from the DEA at the beginning, I think earlier on this, this year, and and, um, and really thinking about the follow-up around the OD, the OD maps as part of the implementation strategy. I've heard that in places like Baltimore, it has really made a big difference. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing from all of you what else we can do to support that and and how do we, we begin to use that as a tool uh, moving forward. And so with that, I'm, like I said, I'm happy to, to second the motion and, um, and really grateful for the county team for really thinking outside the box and really working in partnership with so many people um, to once and for all uh, address this. Um, I think I was in a meeting the other day when somebody mentioned that the number of people who are you know, losing their lives to this every day continues to increase. And so, um, looking forward to continue to do work and once and for all uh, address this public health care. Thank you, Vice Chair. Supervisor Watson Reamer. Uh, yeah, again, I uh, just want to reiterate um, uh, the uh, comments of my colleagues. I think this is obviously very, very important as we move forward with implementation. Um, there's been a lot of interest in this board uh, in uh, opo opioid treatment and um, how we better manage this in our communities, and it's, very, it's so desperately needed. We know the opioid epidemic is growing and becoming even more deadly now that fentanyl is part of the problem. Um, and when we, I think it's important to just comment that when we see death rates rising so steeply, it's really a classic public health situation where we're constantly pulling people out of the river. Uh, but to truly address the problem, we have to go upstream and stop people from falling in. And so we absolutely need all hands on deck to save lives with Narcan when someone has an accidental or overdose. Um, but we have to go upstream and we have to use our public health tools to intervene early and fix the bridge where people are falling into the water. And we can do that with those hazard signs in the forms of education, with more life jackets, um, in the form of increased naloxone available in our communities. Um, so I just really appreciate that this is potentially the first of its kind strategy um, that really tries to go upstream. Um, and I hope that we can make a difference here in San Diego and uh, begin to um, stem the tide of, of the, this epidemic that is facing our community. So thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Anderson. Thank you, Chair Fletcher. Um, 
I, I just want to thank staff for the pro proactive approach. And um, I'm really excited to see this uh, roll out because I think it's going to have a tremendous positive impact on our communities. And Chair Fletcher, I, I want to point out that um, you laid this out in your uh, speech, State of the County, as a, one of your top priorities. And I want to thank you for your leadership because we all got a chance to participate. And uh, I think that our community is going to be a better place because of your leadership on this. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Anderson. Uh, we have a motion by myself, seconded by Vice Chair Vargas, to approve the recommendation to item 28. Please vote. Chair Fletcher, that motion passes unanimously with all supervisors being present and voting aye. We are uh, at almost noon. We're going to break for lunch. Uh, as a board, we will reconvene at 1 p.m. in closed session, uh, and then we will return to open session upon the conclusion of uh, closed session, probably around 1.30ish, uh, somewhere along there. So we will break for lunch until 1. We will reconvene at 1 p.m. sharp in closed session, and then we'll return to open session at the conclusion of that.